Hello and welcome guys. Glad to see you still around. Make yourselves comfortable and enjoy. This is Book of the Dead. Chapter 131. Tyron was confused. So there's a rebellion of sorts developing out there. Although, it doesn't seem like much from what you've said. Slayers can kick up as much of a fuss as they like. They're helpless once the magisters turn the screws he finished bitterly. Not even Magnin and Beery had been able to deny the power of the brand. Resist it, delay. Blunt, perhaps, but ultimately even they had fallen prey, despite their preparations. For all their power, the Slayers were the most helpless people in the Empire. The stronger they became against the Rifkin, the more vulnerable they were to the Magisters. Even if they could rebel despite the marks, what could I do about it? I can't lead them. He couldn't think of anything he was less suited to do. I'm not even willing to fight at all until I reach my milestones and advance my class. Elsbeth shook her head and looked at him as if he were dim. What do you think is going on out there? Armies in the field or something? Don't be ridiculous. Is there anyone on this plane who understands their weakness more than the Slayers? You think they're just going to start throttling Magisters in the streets? She raised her eyebrows and shook her head once more, sending her golden hair rippling in waves down her back. They are moving slowly. Trying to train unmarked people in secret. If this is going to work, it's going to take years. Tyron leaned forward and pressed his palms together, his elbows resting on the table. This made a little more sense. But such things had been tried before. It was impossible for slayers to rebel. The brand would strike them dead if they ever raised a hand to a magister or noble. Even with all they had done to mitigate the mark, it was likely even Magnin and Beery hadn't found a way around that particular restriction. It was, however, possible for them to raise up others to teach and train villagers, or hire a rat, and give them a bit more experience than was strictly necessary. His father had been the one to tell him about it. Magnin could even name a few of the incidents. The Farmer's Rebellion, the Sundered Siege, the Red Fields. It always ended the same way. Throughout history, the Magisters had been consistently shitty at their job. A surprising fact? But when they had literal divines on their side, as well as the unbreakable magic of the brand, it may be excusable that they dropped the ball every couple of hundred years. However, they found out eventually. Sometimes they uncovered an unmarked warrior in the rifts, and got on top of things early. Sometimes they woke up to find a keep had been burned down, and one of their order had been strung up by the neck. Once it started, it was basically over. The gold slayers would be compelled to crush the rebellion. And if the situation was dire enough, they would bring help from the central province. Not even Magnin knew who these enforcers were. He just knew they were absurdly strong and inhumanly brutal. This is dangerous stuff, Beth, he warned her. How deeply are you involved? With an exasperated scoff, she slapped the table with the flat of her palm. You can't seriously are you trying to warn me off? I know what you want, Tyron. I think it's a stupid waste, but you're determined to do it anyway. The necromancer felt the anger in his chest roar into life. He clenched his jaw and spoke deliberately. You think it's a waste? He rasped. After what they did to my family. She sensed his pain and her eyes brimmed with sympathy. But she didn't back down. Yes. Yes. Because your mother and father did everything they could to ensure you would be free. That you wouldn't have to live your life for vengeance. She reached across the table and clasped his hand. Look at what you have here. Look at what you've built. A shop, a trade, respect from you workers, a chance to make a difference in people's lives. You probably don't know this, but the people down there in the market are so pleased, so proud to have someone like you living and working down here with them. They love your work, they rave about it. There was a dull ache in his chest, but it was quickly consumed by the fire. All of this he waved at the building around them only exists because I want vengeance. He released her hand. It seems a little strange that the person who's supposed to be getting me to help. This doomed rebellion is trying to talk me out of it. What do you need me to do? What do your patrons need me to do? Despite everything she'd gone through the past four years, he could still see the old Elsbeth in the way she looked back at him. She cared so much, and she didn't mind who knew it. Her emotions were still written all over her face. It was difficult for him to hurt her even now. But he was unshakable. I'd hoped after everything that happened, you might have had a chance to be happy. That's all. Tyron shook his head decisively, his eyes void of feeling. No. The word cut through the conversation like an axe blade, silencing them both. He waited. Elsbeth drew in a slow breath. 
For now, there isn't much that you're requested to do. Mainly, funnel resources. Gold, weapons, supplies, things that can't be traced. You have contacts in the city that aren't connected to any followers of the three. Information is the other key element. There are already people on the inside passing along snippets, but they're slayers. You can access places that they can't. Here, things that they won't. And the three expect me to stick my neck out like this for no reward. Our relationship is very much one of give and take. His old friend pulled a face. You'll get your reward. Probably. Probably. Well, I haven't been told what it will be. And the three aren't exactly known for their generous natures. So I have no idea what you're going to get. Didn't they literally hand out divinity itself on a whim? Yes. Once. Technically five times. In one instance. Tyrant sighed. As long as they provide something that will help me with my necromancy research, I'll be satisfied. Your necromancy research? What do you mean? He rubbed his hand through his hair and scowled at Elsbeth. It's not like there's a manual or teacher I can use. Necromancy is illegal in the Empire, remember. I have to figure everything out myself. It's painstaking work, and slow going. I'd love for a little help from my patrons. But they seem extremely reluctant to come good on their promises. Elsbeth scratched at her chin with one finger as she thought. Well, I have no idea if there's anyone amongst the worshippers of the three with any knowledge of necromancy. But there might be. I'll ask around, and if I can't find anything, I'll appeal to the gods myself. A generous offer, much better than what he'd received from yore, and certainly far beyond the vague whispers of the abyss. Even so, he was concerned. Isn't this dangerous for you? Approaching the old gods and needling them for favors isn't something I would consider safe. I don't want you to risk yourself. The priestess scoffed. Pestering the gods to help people they wouldn't normally help is basically my job. Don't worry. I'll make sure you get some help. If you're going to stick your neck out for them, the least they can do is cough up a few secrets. I'm grateful. Really grateful. I appreciate it, Beth. I haven't been comfortable dealing with the three. But with you around, I think we might be able to get somewhere. She beamed at him. That's what I'm here for. I'm a link between the people and the gods. With their business concluded the two old friends fell to reminiscing. Joking back and forth and discussing their experiences over the past four years. They talked back and forth until Tyron realized just what the time was. Oh, I'll have to ask your forgiveness, Elsbeth. I have an appointment in the city. She nodded easily and rose from her seat. That's alright, I have a place to stay not far away, so we can meet up again soon. Probably best if you don't come too often. She rolled her eyes. Yes, yes, Mr. Secrecy, I understand. I'll be discreet, don't worry. I won't come back until I've started making my inquiries. When I have something for you, I'll make sure to let you know. Fantastic. She walked around the table and enveloped him in a firm hug before he escorted her down the stairs and out the door. It had been good to reconnect with her, and it was almost odd to have someone be so unreservedly on his side. If there was anyone in the realm he would trust to deal with him straight, it would probably be Elsbeth. She didn't have a deceitful bone in her body. If the old gods decided to screw him over, she would likely just tell him to his face, which was far better than a knife in the back. Thinking of knives made him shudder. If he wanted to make it to the restaurant on time, he would need to leave shortly. Folletta would be pissed if he was late. Two days later, Tyron had mostly healed from his encounter with the thief, and was busy in his workshop when he received another visitor. It was closing time and heavy clouds hung in the sky overhead, when a wide-eyed Seri knocked on his door, practically vibrating at the effort of restraining her gossip-loving spirit. Wondering who in the world it would be this time, he descended the stairs and almost tripped and fell flat on his face. When he saw Yor standing on the shop floor, dressed as if she were attending a ball, Seri studied his every move out of the corner of her eye, and once again, he could see the door to the back room creak open, so Fling could listen in. These idiots. Trying to regain some semblance of poise, Tyron stalked across the shop floor until he drew near enough to hiss. What in the abyss are you doing in my shop? The vampire eyed him with icy dignity. Perhaps we should take a discussion somewhere private, she announced, caressing the final word. Seri squeaked behind the desk, and Tyron was pretty sure he heard Flynn fall off his seat. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath before he stood to the side, and gestured for Yor to follow him upstairs. 
The whispers downstairs from the few remaining customers chased him up each step until he ripped open the door at the top and strained with all his effort not to slam it behind him after his guest had passed through. She watched him with a slight smirk on her blood red lips, doubtless waiting for him to explode with rage, but he throttled it and matched her stare for stare. I assume the cloud cover is helping you rise a little earlier in the day. Indeed, not to mention winter is drawing near. The days grow shorter, and the nights grow longer. I thought we had an agreement that you wouldn't come here in person. There's a reason I've been trudging over to your place of business. And it isn't because I like the atmosphere. you all looked at him imperiously. I would have thought you would be a little more grateful. Besides, having a reputation for associating with beautiful women is hardly overtly damaging. Besides, Master Armsfield and I have already been seen in public together. But not here. Wait, did you say women? Did she know about Elsbeth? The court delivers on its commitments she announced, reaching into the bag slung over her shoulder and removing a tightly bound volume. Let it not be said that we renege on our agreements. As we agreed, this grimoire has been provided by my mistress for you to peruse. She raised a finger. For one month, Tyron stared at the book with naked hunger. Oh, you're added almost as an afterthought. I also brought this. She reached into the bag once again and removed a carved onyx skull. Fuck me, Dove exclaimed. You live here, kid. The place looks positively habitable. I was expecting a stinking cave or some shit. Chapter 132. This is more like what I was expecting. A true shithole. Something dank and dripping. You've come back up in my eyes, Tyron. I knew you still had that filthy, cave dwelling creep inside you. Dove. No, seriously, I'm fucking proud of you. You didn't let the wealth or the luxury get to your head. You knew who you were, deep down, and created a stinking basement filled with bones and guts like the troglodyte you are. I'd applaud, but for obvious reasons. I won't. Tyron sighed and placed the skull down on his table, before he placed the grimoire next to Dove and slumped into his chair. How many skeletons do you have down here? You've been getting busy. Hope you aren't killing them all yourself. I do have to say, it's nice not to be stuck hanging off some dickhead's dick. I've seen some shit recently, Tyron. Some dark, dark shit. Dove Tyron said, more insistently. What? The skull replied, begrudgingly. His previous, familiar, lively and sarcastic tone vanished. We need to talk. Now that you're here, we need to work out Dash. Work out what? Huh. Work out what what to do with me. Go on then, tell me what you're thinking. What are we going to do here? The flip from normal dove to this anger was so immediate the necromancer didn't know how to respond for a moment. But he pressed forward. Of course his friend was angry, who wouldn't be in his circumstances. Your is gone. It's just you and me here right now. I can smash your skull and you can be free again. Go on to your afterlife. Finally. IT's not that easy, dipshit. The voice of the spirit roared throughout the basement and Tyron winced, hoping his sound dampening enchantments were up to the task. Thankfully, his mentor restrained himself before he spoke again. If you tried to free my soul, what do you think would happen? Your would just swoop in and bring me back again. She pretty much told me so on the way over here. As he spoke, some of the bitterness and despair that the former summoner had kept locked deep inside began to leak out. His was a miserable existence. And had he been alive, he had no doubt madness would have claimed him by now. That doesn't mean she would succeed, Tyron insisted. If we can find a way, we can move you on before they get hold of you. Or I can conceal the fact that you're gone long enough that they lose their chance. Kid, just don't. Fucking don't. You've got no chance of winning when you go against the vampires. And you fucking know it. They've been doing this shit for thousands of years. You're smart, Celine's tits, you've got the fucking gift. But we both know they can run circles around you. When it comes to controlling the dead. It was true, of course it was. That was the entire reason why he'd been so desperate to get his hands on their secrets all this time. To his knowledge, they were the most knowledgeable and powerful masters of the necromantic arts. Not only in this realm, but in all of them. Tyron slumped, defeated. He glanced across at the book sitting flat on his table. I'm willing to bet that book contains precisely the opposite spells to those I would need to set you free. That's a fool's bet. It's basically a guarantee. In fact, I'd go further and say they've done everything they can to ensure what they gave you is of as little use as possible. Need to keep stringing you along, edging, 
but never letting you finish. You didn't need to say it in quite those terms. Sorry, I've been unliving in a brothel for the last year. Suddenly sure that he was right, Tyron reached over and flicked open the cover of the volume, turning over the heavy black cover, and looking at the first page. On the binding and domination of spirits and the dead he read aloud, then sighed. Yet, yeah, he flicked a few more pages. And of course, all the sigils are written in some ancient vampiric bullshit. She said the book had come from her mistress's collection. It's probably a thousand fucking years old, and certainly didn't originate from this plane. I don't think this is just a case of using different symbols to represent each sigil Tyron muttered, flicking through a few more pages, frowning. I think they're using a different form of spell structure entirely. And you only get a month to try and decipher any of it, Dove barked a laugh. Pricks. Tyron grimaced. He could do it in that sort of time frame though it would consume his every waking hour. And even then, he wouldn't be able to decipher all of it. If there were sigils in the book that he didn't know in his own system, then how was he supposed to interpret them? And even if he did, nothing he learned would help Dove, which was his primary concern at that moment. He leaned forward and buried his face in his hands trying to think. There has to be something we can do to help you die. I refuse to let you keep suffering like this. Look kid, I hate being like this. Don't get me wrong, but I've reached the point that I've kind of given up on being able to escape. This is the problem you run into when you get involved with necromancers. Especially when you get on their bad side. You can't fucking die. I'm guessing that prick Rufus is still hanging around somewhere, am I right? Without lifting his head, Tyron nodded slightly. Huh. I knew it. And the girl as well. He hesitated this time, but nodded again. Fuckers. They deserve it. For a while, anyway. Look, I'm pissed. I'm pissed at you for bringing me back the first time. I'm pissed at myself for being such an idiot around you. And I'm absolutely pissed at her for bringing me back again. We had a tiffle goodbye, and all that shit, it was perfect. Then she decided she couldn't let my comments slide, and had to fuck with me, and not in a good way. But although I'm pissed, I'm kind of resigned to it. I'm stuck like this now and will be for a long fucking time. At this point, I'm just hoping that she'll remember to let me go eventually. A miserable way for a soul who'd done more for him than almost any other to end. So I won't bother trying to kill you Tyron relented. You're almost certainly right, there's likely no point in it. I'm sorry Dove. Tyron, I've heard your apologies way too many times. They don't matter anymore. They don't help. I'm just going to ignore how unrelentingly shit this all is as best as I can, until I'm finally set free. It was a hard thing to hear, but he nodded, accepting it. I just wish I could still do my magic the spirit trapped within the skull mused, wistfully. I really loved it, you know. Not like physically, but I enjoyed studying and expanding my knowledge. The slayers I worked with would sternly deny it, but I was serious about that, at least. Yet another thing Dove endured because Tyron had taken it away from him. Yet another blow to his heart. The necromancer's chin dropped to his chest. Then he lifted it again. Wasn't Arin and the Black dead? Ah, yes. He's been dead for a thousand fucking years. Took everything beyond the Boundary Mountains down with him, as I recall my history. Wait, what? I thought Granon fell much later. Well, yeah. But having half your fucking empire ravaged by undead isn't exactly great for your longevity. They hung in there for a while, but eventually fell to the kin. The paths through the mountains were lost shortly after, and nobody's been back over there since. Tyron shook his head. That wasn't what I was talking about. You've obviously read more than me. But as far as I know, descriptions of the necromancer describe him as skeletal, like actual bones. Well, of course. He was a lick, an undead magic user. You know about this shit, kid. Some undead can still use magic, like the vampires. But Arhanan started out as a person. Yes. So, just like you. Again. So, so you can use it too. No, I fucking can't. Oh, no. Shit. No. Tyron. I know that look in your eye. Fucking stop, right now. Tyron felt his heart quickening in his chest, as his eyes began to flick from side to side rapidly, ideas cascading through his head. You can't use magic because you don't have a source. Of course you don't, the source is a physical thing, a part of a body, which you don't have, but what if we made one? Kid, I am not your test dummy. 
But Tyron wasn't listening. He sprang up from his chair and began to pace back and forth. Any lick must have an alternate way to collect and store magic. I know wild licks exist, but without studying one, I can't work out how they do it. Arinan, though he had to create his own when he transitioned to unlife, he had to. I've been experimenting with repositories for exactly this purpose, funneling energy into an undead vessel. Now your case is a little unique, but it should be possible. I can create a matrix that stores magic easily enough. That's just basic. But finding a way to connect it to your spirit, that's harder. This fucking kid, Dove knew what was going to happen next. The crazy was taking over, he could already see it. Fuck me. If I can bind your spirit to a skull, then surely I can bind a repository of power to your spirit. I just, I just. The kid carried on mumbling to himself as he paced back and forth, his arms tracing vague lines in the air, his hands flashing through seemingly random sigils, as he pondered what sequence might bring him the result he desired. This was exactly the look on his face Dove had awoken to when he'd first found himself locked inside his own skull. The same expression he'd had when he created his first revenant. Can't get any fucking worse. Dove thought to himself, resigned to his plight. But, shockingly, the kid turned to him. A hint of lucidity returning to his gaze. Do you want me to try this? Tyron asked. Dove was so shocked it took him a moment to reply. W what? He stuttered. Tyron stormed to the table and stared directly into the glowing orbs within the hollow sockets of the carved skull. I won't try this without your permission. I may succeed. I may not. But if I do, you'll have access to magic again. I really didn't think you were going to ask me. I like to think I've matured. Nice to see. There was a long, drawn-out pause. Dove. I'm fucking thinking. Damn you. Give me a second. Look. I'm not sure if you'll be able to use your summoning magic anymore. And I have no idea if or how the Unseen will interact with you in this state. All of this is unknown. So yes, you would be the experimental case. And that's shit for you. But, I'm confident. Dove. If the two of us work together, we can figure it out. The trapped spirit thought a little longer. I'll only agree if you promise to try and fix me up with a body as well. I want hands and legs, for fuck's sake. That's tricky. But sure, I'll do my best. And a dick. No. Chapter 133. You're generating magic already, somehow. It's not much minuscule, if I'm being honest dash. Don't mock my size. But it's there. This must be how your spirit generates enough energy to maintain itself. I always wondered about that. Because you never created a conduit between the two of us, right? Tyron nodded in confirmation as he continued to peer down at the carved skull through his death lens. At the time, I figured it was just a function of your status. A high level slayer would be a powerful spirit and sustain itself. I didn't really have the time to investigate, so I just glossed over it. Now though, I have to wonder how it works. You need to remember I'm not in my original vessel anymore. Perhaps when you stuffed me into my skull, the bones were generating magic the same way your bony boys do, converting ambient magic into death-attuned energy. Considering I was hanging around all your skeletons, they could have been feeding it to me as well. Tyron put down the lens and pondered for a moment, arms folded over his chest. That's possible. Are you suggesting that perhaps your current vessel works as a descriptor? I suppose your current vessel is different. Modified. Somehow. One way to find out. I don't think I can crack it open without freeing your spirit. You don't have to break it, you ass. Aren't you a fancy schmancy enchanter or some shit? Bust out the tools and get fancy, for fuck's sake. Fucking found it. Thank the mother's memories. I was getting sick of being rolled around this table. Hunched over the table, Tyron continued to focus through his glass, tracing the incredibly fine filaments carved on the inside of the cheek bonus. Blood and bone. I can't believe they managed to fit such dense script in there. It's not even powered by a core. Fuck me. It had taken two straight days of exhaustingly careful analysis to find the script. If he hadn't been so careful, he likely would have tripped one of the four hidden matrices. That would have dissolved the skull to dust in his hands. Disabling those had taken a full day on its own. They seriously didn't want anyone to examine this thing too closely. Don't call me a thing. That hurts my feelings. And, let's be real. The only person who was going to look at it was you. They didn't want you to look at it too closely. 
I can see why Tyron muttered, this is incredible stuff. If I'm not wrong, this script does exactly what you suggested it might. It takes an ambient magic and converts it to death-aligned energy. That's what's been powering you. If, if you damaged it in some minute way, would that drain me of power? Over time, maybe I'd be able to escape that way. Before they notice what's happening, Tyron sat back and gave the suggestion the thought it deserved. Ultimately, he shook his head. It's possible it might work the way you suggest. But it's also possible that it would just drain you until you couldn't be in your awake state. And then you'd just be sleeping inside the skull forever, rather than being set free. Well, shit. It might work. I can do it, for sure, if you want me to. No dove sighed, if I stopped waking up, Yor would realize something was wrong and just fix it. Even if she didn't, I wouldn't get free. Damn it all. Let's keep going with your plan. Well, this is a huge step forward. I need to copy out this script and study it. If I can figure out how, I can use this to feed you the power you need. Instead of taking in ambient energy. I'll feed it magic straight from my power array. This script will do the work of conversion for me, and feed that magic straight to you. Unspeakably excited, Tyron got to work. Due to the incredibly fine work and the awkward position it had been done, he had to use small mirrors, his fingers, and a thin paint that he eventually blotted onto a clean sheet of paper to get a clear picture of the enchantment. Only then could he get to work on interpreting it. It's ridiculously sophisticated Tyron groaned as he rubbed his eyes. How long had it been since he slept? It didn't matter, he was fascinated by what he was seeing. Of course it is. This is vampire bullshit. I've never seen your do anything in a straightforward manner if she had the option to do it in a needlessly bizarre and labyrinthine way instead. I imagine the attitude filters through every aspect of their spellwork as well. Tyron grunted as he continued to trace lines and sigils onto yet another clean copy of paper. Apparently, there are differences between vampire groups. Some of them are a bit more direct in their methods. I was warned that they might come for me. Oh, great. So not only are they of limited help, they're an active danger as well. To be fair, I never considered your to be anything other than dangerous. I didn't think she could hurt me. I was already dead. I wasn't mocking you, just stating a fact. Oh, well, don't look so smug when you do it. I wasn't. Oh, yes, you were, smuggy. Can I focus on this enchantment, please? Fine. As Tyron continued to work, he couldn't help but muse out loud. I always intended to use my enchanting skills as a way to enhance my necromancy, but I didn't expect to get the chance so soon. Dove was a little confused. What do you mean, so soon? You've been out here at this shop for months. What have you been doing all this time? Trying to max my core skills before I hit level 40. Oh, shit. I guess I kind of assumed you'd advance to silver ages ago. Never had the chance. I've been running experiments trying to increase my corpse appraisal and corpse preparation. When that's done, I want to hit my cat with raised dead as well, possibly bone stitching too. It's a lot of work, but it'll put you in good stead going forward dove mused. Only after that was I intending to start implementing my enchanting ideas. Trying to focus on too many things at once would stall my progress on every front. Speaking of, you probably haven't thought much on this so far. But I wonder if you have any ideas about your third subclass. I assume you've hit human level 20. Tyron paused. I have. Reached it I mean. To be honest. I've not given much thought to it, considering everything I have on my plate already. Something that can make my undead better. That's all I have right now. Huh. I thought you might consider some sort of mage class, so you have a better variety of spells to play with. Or a defensive class to keep yourself alive. The necromancer shook his head. If you think about it, all of those purposes can be served by simply having stronger minions. I could add some sort of fire mage subclass and throw fireballs around to do what? To damage my enemies. Stronger undead fighting for me will do that just fine. Protect myself. Some sort of defender subclass. Stronger undead could protect me just as well. You're probably right Dove considered your subclasses are meant to supplement and support your main class. So what's going to help you create better minions? I'm not sure. With the enchanting, I had a clear idea of what I could do, the weakness it could shore up. Specifically, helping lighten the burden on my magic. For the next step, 
I'm not sure. Perhaps I'll have a clearer picture after I advance my class again. Where the heck do you think you're going to stick that? Deep, deep inside you. Tyron. That's so filthy, it brings a tear to my eye. Metaphorically. Shut up. Seriously though, where is it going to fit? I'm only skull-sized. The young mage picked up the matrix he'd designed and held it in front of the skull, spread across his two palms. It looks bigger than it really is, and to be honest, there's more surface area inside your skull than you think there is. So I'm big after all. I thought you said size doesn't matter. That was before I learned how massive I was. Tyron rolled his eyes. Right. Anyway, if I make it much smaller than this, then the amount of power it can store won't be significant enough to do much with. I can create another array and connect it to this one, doubling or tripling the available energy. When you have a body, and I have more room to work with. Fair enough. Still, are you sure this is going to work? I have no idea. This is entirely guesswork. That gives me a lot of confidence. Look, it should work. I believe it will work. But I'm not a vampire with thousands of years of experience, alright? I'm just trying to figure this out as best I can. You're right, you're right. I told you to go ahead and try in the first place. Fine, turn me over and stitch me up. I'm ready. I'm going to have to bolt you in place while I'm working. This is going to take hours to get it housed properly. Well, great. Off to sleep for me then. A week without sleep. Seven days straight of continuous work, and it all came down to this. He felt exhausted down to his bones. His head swam every time he moved, and his eyes felt completely raw. Simultaneously, he felt elated. The deep-rooted satisfaction that came from new discovery, from pushing his skills to their limits and developing something new. It was a euphoric experience. The grimoire he had received from your lay forgotten on the side of the table, as he unclamped the carved skull and turned it back over, placing Dove carefully in the center of his workspace. If all had gone well, then his power array was currently absorbing ambient magic, storing it, and then feeding it to the matrix the vampires had etched on him. If it worked as he believed it did, then that power would be converted to death magic, before being sent straight to Dove's spirit. What effect that would have, and what Dove could then do with that energy, he had no idea. Hopefully, the former summoner could draw on that reservoir to cast spells. He wouldn't be able to do what he'd done before, namely, summon creatures from the astral plane, since death magic wasn't useful for that purpose. But he could figure something out. Maybe. WW what the what the fuck. The dim lights in the hollow eyes of the skull flickered and brightened, as the spirit within stirred himself from his rest. Hello. Dove Tyron croaked before he coughed, took a sip of water from his flask and tried again. Ch hello Shit. How do you feel? Better than you. I think, which is an achievement, since I'm fucking dead. I know what you're asking, though, I can definitely feel something is different. For want of a better term, you're all hooked up. I've tested every part of the power network, and it's functioning as it should. The work I did to connect it to the existing matrix is also working. Energy is flowing. It's nothing like what you would have had available as a human. But it's a heck of a lot more than you had before. A hundred times, at least. Yes, I can feel the difference, for sure. I feel better. Somehow. More solid. I can see a bit better also. If we give it a day to build up, we can try and get you to cast some verbal spells. Something simple. See if it works. Fuck yes Dove breathed. I can't fucking wait. Chapter 134. Your couldn't sense Tyron inside his little shop. Which was usually a sure sign he was locked in his basement fussing over bones and running experiments. It would have been amusing. Watching him struggle to unlock even the most basic knowledge she had been taught in the first year of her apprenticeship. But it wasn't, she knew what kind of mind was housed in that skull. Still, it would be years before he could build his knowledge to the point where she couldn't consider herself better in the necromantic arts. She was tempted, if only slightly, to enter the shop and make a show of herself, but decided against it. There was no need to antagonize him, especially when he'd been so testy lately. She sighed. That meant she would need to infiltrate his study. A trivial exercise to someone with her talents. But it meant entering the sewers, which she was reluctant to do. 
After a moment of concentration, Yor felt her senses expand, until every whisper became a shout, every glint of light a jagged beam in her eye, even the touch of the air on her dead skin felt oppressive. After a few seconds of searching, she relaxed, allowing everything to return to normal. She walked around the corner and down the street, until she came across what she had been searching for, a sewer grate, used by the maintenance crews to enter the tunnels. Through the small gaps in the metal plate, she could already smell the stench below, which caused her to grimace with distaste. She could go through the shop and break the protections on the hidden entrance. Tyron would be incensed. With a final sigh, Yor stepped into the gathering shadows between market stalls, and melded with the shadows. A moment later, a thick trail of blood oozed across the ground with gathering speed, falling into the drain and out of sight. When she arrived in the basement and began to reform her body, she'd hoped for a strong reaction to her dramatic reveal. Doubtless, the boy had been wrestling with the tome she had given him, a valuable text for someone of his level, if he could interpret it. She expected a weary and bedraggled tyrant to turn and exclaim at the mysterious pillar of blood that slowly resolved itself into her glorious form. When her eyes were whole, what she saw was rather different than expectations. Rather than weary and bedraggled, tyrant appeared like a madman, unshaven and filthy, wearing soiled clothing, his hair a mess of gnarled golden locks, and eyes almost completely bloodshot. Instead of carefully translating the sigils of the vampires, he was engaged in a furious argument with a hand. The necromancer was throwing his arms around the place, pointing and yelling, while the hand darted back and forth, and made rude gestures at him. Dove was positioned nearby, sitting on the table, apparently talking also. What were they doing? Her ears were completed a few seconds later, and she was treated to their stimulating discourse. That's not how it works, you donkey tire and bellowed, throwing his arms in the air once more. The transfer isn't lossless regardless of what you think you see. I can detect the residue through the lens, and you fucking know it. Would you just listen to me, you cockless wonder? I know it isn't lossless, alright. I fucking know that. What I'm saying, comma, is that we are talking a fraction of a percent. That much shouldn't matter, it can be safely ignored. We have to find efficiencies. Yes, even here. Just because the loss is small doesn't mean it can't be reduced or eradicated. You're just a fucking perfectionist. Let it go. Yes, I am, and no, I won't. Am I interrupting something? Your drawled once her vocal cords had reformed. Tyron turned to see the still congealing mass of vaguely your shaped blood in the corner of his study and blinked. Oh, hey your, has it been a month already? He began to fumble around on the table for the volume. Where did I put that book? He muttered, blinking owlishly. That was it? She definitely felt her display deserved more of a reaction than that. Good to know your security is so lacking that any undead can simply materialize inside your private sanctum without you even noticing she observed acidly. What? He replied absently, still shifting things on his desk. Oh, security. I have wards in the sewers around here specifically for undead. I knew you were coming five minutes ago. Sorry, I didn't greet you properly. I was distracted. The oaf snickered and she glared at the carved skull on the table. I see a time apart has relaxed your manners. It won't take long for that mistake to be corrected. I've learned a couple of things over the last month. I think you'll be impressed with my progress. Like this. Death Bolt. A blast of magic flew from the hand on the table toward her, shocking the vampire to the point she almost didn't react. Thankfully, her speed was more than a match to the task, and she slapped the spell down with the flat of her hand. What was that? She demanded of Tyron, and infuriatingly, he turned back to face her and said, What? That Cretan she declared, pointing imperiously at the skull, just attacked me with a spell. Tyron pinched his brow and groaned, For fuck's sake, Dove. You promised me you wouldn't do that. I was tempted beyond my means to resist. No, none of your bullshit. I'm disconnecting the hand. What? That's bullshit. The necromancer ignored his protests, at which point, the skeletal hand on the desk leapt up onto its fingertips, and tried to skitter across the table, but Tyron dove on it, and muttered a few words, as he tinkered with something. Instantly, the hand fell motionless, and he placed it back on the table. I'm really sorry about that. You're... I warned him not to do anything stupid. But between you and me, I'm pretty sure he's gone insane being locked in that skull. 
Is he the only one who's gone insane? She asked him pointedly looking him up and down. The young mage followed her gaze, uncomprehending, before he gave an embarrassed cough and plucked at this filthy clothes. Oh, this. Yes, it's been busy over the last month. I do have to thank you for the book, though it's been exceptionally helpful. If only I could, ah, uh, aha, uh -huh. I knew I'd put it somewhere. He shuffled across the room and picked up Dove, who squawked in protest to reveal the vampire text had been sitting under the skull, propping him up slightly. Tyron brandished the bound volume triumphantly. Here it is. Thank you very much for providing this. It was incredibly informative. If you get a chance, pass on my appreciation to Master Hikari. Really insightful and clearly presented ideas. The words were distinguished, but they came from such a disheveled and wild-looking frame that she almost laughed at the incongruity. So you translated it? Then, she asked a little surprised. Oh, a good chunk of it, I suppose. The useful bits? I copied a lot of it. I can figure the rest out later. Oh, I thought you might struggle a little more with the vampiric runes. Tyron blinked. Blinked again. Ah, that's right. That was the point, wasn't it? I was supposed to have a hard time cracking it. Extracting only a little information after painstaking effort, and then giving it back. We wouldn't be that cruel you're smirked. Yes you would. He didn't even sound upset about it. The words were delivered flat and without emotion, stating the reality in concrete terms. That's probably what would have happened if I didn't find that script in Dove Skull. Reverse engineering that gave me almost two dozen sigils that I could turn around and apply to the book. It's like picking at a particularly gruesome knot he plucked at the air vaguely with his fingers. Once you manage to get a few threads, the rest unravels much more easily. She turned her eyes to Dove placidly silent on the bench. You found what? What have you done? Isn't it obvious? I linked a power array to the matrix you put in the skull to feed him death magic. Then I used the information in the book to start binding his soul to a body. We managed to get the hand connected. But I'm trying to find a more efficient way to do it. Since there's a bit of energy loss. And there isn't really any reason why there should be. It's normal in magic to expect some energy loss Dove scoffed. You just need to get over it. I won't accept loss I can't explain tire and shot back, red eyes glaring. I could have been dancing around with a full skeletal body by now, if it weren't for this dickhead dove side. Even having a hand to move was incredible. And you did all this in a month? You're asked. Tyron looked abashed. Well, I had to manage my experiments and make sure the shop was stocked. That's probably why I look like such a wildman. I haven't slept in dove. Five days. Shit. The vampire looked at him sideways. You know the undead do not need to sleep. If you shed the confines of your mortality, you could be so much more. Oh, this again. Wait, don't you sleep every time the sun is up? Not technically. What the vampires experience was closer to torpor than sleep. But there are other forms of undead. If you do not wish to be a vampire, you aren't far away from transforming Dove into a lick. The same process could be undertaken for you. Only much more sophisticated. He grimaced. No thanks. And I wouldn't consider Dove anything close to a proper lick. He has a trickle of power available to him, and no access to the unseen. How do you manage that? Being dead. Well, I suppose you have access to blood, don't you? The necromancer rubbed at his eyes and sighed. I'm sure there's a way to do it. There wouldn't be any point to becoming a lick if you could no longer progress in the eyes of the unseen. Any hints or clues, you're... She smiled and shook her head, her raven black hair waving softly against her neck. I will only say that it is, in fact, possible to give away such a powerful secret for free. However, I cannot allow it. I figured, well, here's your book. And here's Dove. Huh. The spirit protested as Tyron plucked him from the bench and presented him to Yor along with the tome. I'd appreciate it if you could bring him back again sometime soon he said, as difficult as it is to have him around. It's very useful to have another mage to talk to, and help figure this stuff out. He hesitated. Besides, he'll probably drive you nuts if you keep him around for too long. Having access to magic has made him a little bit unbalanced. I'll keep that in mind she said wryly shaking her head. Even when she thought she knew what he was capable of, he continued to surprise her. This was definitely someone worth keeping close to the court. I have little doubt that Dove fully intends to make a nuisance of himself, 
so that I feel compelled to be rid of him, she said, talking to both of them. So, rather than squash his feeble efforts, I will instead offer to return him to you next month, as long as he behaves. Tyron looked pleased, but then glanced down at the skull and shrugged. Well, that's up to him. I can't make him behave. I'm not a child dove haft. Yor and Tyron looked down at him incredulously. I just act like one to annoy people the skull admitted. It usually works. You don't fucking say. Thanks Yor. I'll see you in a month, then. Won't you coming to our regular catch up in two weeks? She asked, arching her brow. He slumped. Can't we just talk here and now? Or in a month? Absolutely not. We have an arrangement. The conditions must be met. Fine, he relented, then stomped toward the stairs. I suppose you can see yourself out. Then, I'm going to bed. Chapter 135 Work continued in a flurry of activity for Tyron. After Yor returned with Dove, he slept for two days before he awoke, feeling like a dead man. With some food and drink in him, he felt much better. But noticed as he pulled his clothes on he was looking dangerously thin. Once upon a time, he'd had his Aunt Meg and Uncle Worthy chasing him down and shoving delicious tavern meals down his throat. Since his awakening, he'd never really settled into a healthy routine, not even when he'd enrolled as Master Willem's apprentice. He'd worked himself to the bone, hunched over his bench at all hours, eating whatever he could scrounge from the kitchens when someone reminded him to eat. Should he hire a cook, perhaps someone to feed the staff in the store he knew Flynn didn't eat properly, although he might have seen Seri bringing him food. No, he was the only one who needed help in this regard. He looked at the contents of his pantry. Dried meat, hard biscuits, pickled vegetables. Am I traveling? He muttered incredulously to himself before slamming the cupboard door closed. That's it, I'm getting a proper meal. Having decided his course of action, he finished dressing himself and left the store after a brief discussion with Seri, stepping out into the crowded streets for what felt like the first time in weeks. He carefully tried not to think about the fact it likely was the first time in weeks. There were a few good places to eat near the market square, reputable taverns, although he also had the option to go into the city and find something more upmarket. To hell with it, he decided, I can't be bothered traveling inside the walls. Rather than head to the stables and coach hiring houses, he wandered through the market itself, enjoying the sunshine, and feeling the bustling crowd moving around him. After a time, he realized with a jolt, he didn't feel that surge of irrational anger or hatred at these people moving around him, going about their day. Farmers man stalls, selling fresh produce from the fields, shoppers haggled with crafters and tradespeople, offering their wares and services, and it all seemed fine. He wasn't sure if it was a good or bad thing that he felt more calm, or why. Perhaps being around more people, Valletta, Dove, Victor, Elsbeth, even your to some extent, had been good for him. Helped unwind a little of the tension he'd been holding tight inside his chest. Regardless of the reason, his rumbling stomach urged him to find something more substantial to fill it. And so he left the stalls and moved to the outer edge of the square, where the more established businesses could be found. He trailed his eyes across the stalls until he found himself staring up at one quizzically. There was no way right. With a bemused expression, he pushed his way through the door, eyes wandering. It was a small place with only five wooden tables and simple furniture. But it was clean, and the smells wafting from the kitchen were delicious. A hint of smoke and roasting meat. There weren't any staff manning the counter. So he leaned against it and waited, until someone came through and he almost fell over. Welcome, she said with a bright smile. Are you here to eat? Wara, yes. Absolutely. Thank you. No problem. Why don't you grab a seat and I'll be over in a minute to let you know what's in the pot today. Thanks. He tried not to act weird, she clearly didn't recognize him. After four years, she'd done a lot of growing up. But she was still far too attractive to be that man's daughter. Don't see a well-dressed gentleman like you around the market all that often she said as she walked up to the table with a jug of water and a glass. Are you from around here? Me? Yes. I run I own a store nearby. Oh really? Which one? Armsfield Enchantments. That's you, Master Armsfield. Well, welcome to my humble store. I know it isn't much, I awakened as a cook not that long ago. But you'll not find finer cuts of meat this side of the wall. That's our guarantee. Yes, your father's a butcher, I take it. She nodded, happily. That's right, been at it for a long time. Used to work out on the rifts, monster parts mostly. 
but now he's working on cows and game. Speaking of which, we have roast beef over the fire with vegetables or a venison stew. Do either take your fancy. The roast, thanks. Gravy, of course. And anything to drink. An ale if you have any. In short order, she'd served the meal and given him some space to enjoy it. Stopping by to offer him a top up and engaging in some chat. He managed to steer the conversation to where her father had worked before, and she explained their flight from Woodsedge. It was horrible she shivered. That noise was like nothing I'd ever heard before. And the monster's sorry. I don't like to talk about it much. My father and I barely made it out, but we lost my mother. It was a very painful time. I'm sorry to have brought up such awful memories Tyron said awkwardly, kicking himself for prying. It seems you've done well to find your feet he gestured to the store around them. Oh, thank you. It hasn't been easy, but we're getting there. She hadn't lied about the food either. Her cooking skill was likely still quite low, and it showed in the food, but the meat was exquisite. All she needed was time and practice, some trial and error, before her class and skills began to climb. He finished his plate with relish, considered asking for more, but checked himself. He thumbed a coin from his pouch and onto the table. I hope that covers everything. That more than covers everything. Wait there and I'll get you some change. No, no. It's quite alright. I need to be on my way. Absolutely not, sir. You wait right there. She rushed out the back of the store, leaving Tyron standing by himself in the dining area. After glancing around a few times, he turned and sprinted out the door. Behind him, the proud sign, painted in red and white, Red Gunderson Meats and Eatery. Someone to see you, Master Armsfield. Damn it all. Who is it this time? Oh, ah, I'm sorry. Tyron sighed and pushed himself back from his bench, tossing away his pliants. Sorry. Sorry. I didn't mean to snap at you. I'm just getting tired of people coming to the store and bothering me when I'm trying to work. It's quite alright, Master Armsfield. I completely understand. No, it's not alright, and it won't happen again. Now, who was it? Right. I don't think I know this person. I haven't seen them in the store before, but they said they had a delivery for you. He frowned and pushed himself up from his seat. A delivery? Did they say you from? No. Well, I'll go talk to them. Irritated at being disrupted, he tried to smooth the frustration from his face as he descended the stairs. If it was one of his suppliers, then it wouldn't do to be snapping their heads off for entering his place of business. But he didn't recognize the man in dusty-looking robes, holding a wide, stitched hat waiting on the shop floor. He stood unusually still, only shifting his head slightly as he looked down at the wares on display. Hello, can I help you sir? Tyron asked, forcing a slight smile onto his face. It was the best he could do. Are you Master Armsfield? The man replied, turning to face him directly and staring him right in the eyes. Yes, I am. The straightforward demeanor of the stranger was almost threatening, but the necromancer didn't sense any ill will. Perhaps this was a cultural thing, or maybe this person was just odd. Our friend from the desert asked me to deliver this to you. Didn't think you'd want them in your store again. He reached deep into his own voluminous sleeve and retrieved a scroll case from within, presenting it to Tyron on his open palm. The mage's eyes lit up with greed the moment he laid his eyes on it. He reached out and carefully took the case in both hands. Many thanks. Would you care to stay for some refreshment? No. Our business is concluded and I must be elsewhere. Thank you. With the slightest tip of his head, the well-tanned stranger turned on his heel and strode from the store. Such actions could be considered rude, but Tyron was more than pleased. Nothing to delay him from examining the scroll. I'll be heading back upstairs. Sari, let me know if you need me. Of course, Master Armsfield. Did you know that person? No. Never met him before in my life, but I was expecting this to arrive at some point. Without another word he strode up the stairs two at a time and burst into his workshop, grinning. Of course, it wouldn't be sensible to simply open the case without some precautionary measures. So he scryed it with his eye spell, used magic to examine the case, and carefully inspected it through his lens before he opened it. Inside, he found a small sheet of paper wrapped around a longer one. The first sheet was a short letter from Shadda, written in a barely legible scrawl. I have spoken to the elders and they consented to allow me to send you this. It is nothing special, but better than nothing. Shadder. Man of few words Tyron muttered as he put the letter aside and withdrew the scroll. 
He unraveled it eagerly, only to find it was significantly longer than he expected it to be, slipping from his grasp and rolling off his bench and onto the floor. Gingerly, he gripped the top and bottom and began to carefully roll it back up until he was holding the first section in front of his face. This would have been so much more convenient as a book. However, his mild complaints were washed away as he read, then shuffled the scroll to examine the next section, then the next. These were instructions for Golem building, exactly what he'd been hoping for. What's more, they included a detailed written description of the sigils used for the construction of the artificial mind. The necromancer almost felt like dancing. With this, he could finally begin to unravel the process behind the simple artificial consciousness that was implanted in his minions. Once he understood it, he could begin to improve it. This could be the beginning of a monumental leap forward in the quality of his undead. Just thinking of the possibilities had him on the edge of abandoning his workshop and rushing down to the basement. Settle down, Tyron. Breathe. He couldn't go down there yet. There was work to finish for the shop, and vanishing during the day when the staff were around carried an element of risk. With care, he rolled up the scroll and returned it to its case before putting it aside and forcing himself to return to his enchanting. He had plenty of time, all the time in the world. It would take a lot of work to fully unravel the information contained in the scroll, and much more to then apply that to the raised dead ritual. Combined with what he'd learned from the vampiric text, it may be enough to push his level in that spell to its maximum. Chapter 136 So much progress in such a short amount of time, it was dizzying. With the knowledge Tyron had gained from the vampiric text along with the treasure he had received from the dust folk, he was finally in a position to develop the most difficult aspects of the raised dead ritual. Naturally, Tyron threw himself into his work, feverishly scribbling and theorizing in his study, only emerging when he was forced to. Several social engagements demanded his time, one with Valletta, another with Victor, but he was too distracted to properly engage with either. Even focusing on his shop and ensuring the smooth running of his business was immensely difficult. He felt as if he'd been stalled at the starting line for so long, but now he was finally ready to race. Secluded in his basement, Tyron continued his experimentation as he built out his ideas. Testing on the remains he sourced from the thieves had never ceased, and he continued to see minor breakthroughs. Attempts to develop a method that would allow him to accurately determine the suitability of a specific skeleton were finally bearing fruit. Almost by accident, he had discovered the location of death magic first began to accumulate in the bones. In the last set of bodies he had received, one must have been incredibly fresh, since it contained extremely small trace amounts of death-aligned energy. After he inspected the remains carefully with the lens, he quickly butchered the corpse, so that he could examine the bones more carefully. In this examination, he determined that the highest concentration of power was located in the ribs on the left side of the body, closest to where the heart had been. Further tests had led him to develop a metric for working out how long a particular set of remains had been deceased, by measuring the accumulation of energy in this particular area, and by the spread. The complexity came in when he learned not all corpses were created equal. Some spread death energy much faster not only to the remains around them, but also within themselves. Thus, the Tyron Quotient was born, a formula by which he could not only calculate how long the remains had been dead, but how quickly energy spread throughout the corpse. Although he hadn't been able to test the theory yet, it would make sense that those remains which were more receptive to death magic, would make better and stronger minions, or at the very least cheaper to maintain ones. Furthermore, his earlier experimentation with alchemical substances, namely the mixture used to cleanse Rifkin cores, that he'd applied to the bones to remove every trace of organic matter, had led him down another avenue of study. After spending a suspicious amount of time talking to alchemists and doctors, he was finally able to concoct a method that allowed him to determine bone density, as well as produce a solution that actually improved the density of bones when they were submerged in it. Again, he would need to actually raise some minions to test how effective it was, but it was yet another feather in his cap. Naturally, all of this progress had him extremely excited that he was closing in on his goals, but he found himself strangely hesitant to conduct the status ritual and check how far he'd made it. The thought that he would learn he was still far from maximizing his skills was a crushing possibility and it was far too easy to allow himself to be distracted by his work on the raised dead ritual. 
The ritual itself comprised of three main components, a conduit between himself and the undead he created to funnel arcane energy, an artificial mind to allow the undead to think, and a binding that effectively enslaved the undead to his will. The text the vampires had provided dealt with the final part, the binding of undead entities. Although there wasn't much he found he could do to improve this aspect of the ritual, full and total control over basic undead was already full and total control. After all, he was able to understand it much better. He also felt this knowledge would be much more useful when it came to binding more complex undead, such as ghosts and revenants. His control over those was far less robust. What Shatter had provided allowed him to gain insight into the second aspect of the ritual, the construct which formed the mind of the undead. Finally able to place many of the sigils in their proper context, his understanding of them grew by leaps and bounds. After several weeks of study, he could finally say he fully comprehended how the mind was constructed and how it functioned. The first element of the ritual, the conduit, he'd already completely rebuilt from the ground up using everything he'd learned from his enchanting work. Finally out of excuses, Tyron could no longer put it off, and he conducted the status ritual. Drawing a nervous and shaky breath, he pressed his hand to the page and spoke the words, not even watching as his blood flowed over the paper. When it was done, he snapped his eyes down and read quickly, greedily, desperate to see if he'd finally reached his goals. Past the dozen notifications of the progress he'd made, he saw something that caused his heart to skip a beat. Undead Weaver had reached level 38. Two whole levels had been gained from his shenanigans with Dove, and his improvements to his craft. Only two left before he would need to advance his class. He bit his lip in frustration. That meant he couldn't perform the status ritual again, until he was certain he'd achieved what he needed, lest he risk triggering the advance early. A frustrating position to be in, but it was inevitable that his level would increase. He'd known it would happen eventually, though he'd hoped it wouldn't be this soon. Still, there were two notifications that caused his heart to leap inside his chest. Corpse appraisal has reached level 19. Corpse preparation has reached level 19. So close. He was so close. One final push and he'd have reached the first of his requirements. He was so pleased he pushed himself away from his desk, pumping his arms with glee. Even better news. Ray's dead has reached level 24. Six more levels and he would reach the cat which had been increased by his undead specialist feat. To do that, he'd need to make substantial improvements to the remaining two aspects of the ritual he was the least comfortable with. But at least he had a chance now, thanks to the help he'd received. Some minor improvements to his enchanting didn't help much, though he was a little surprised to see his bone soul melding and spirit binding had improved dramatically. In fact, they both reached their maximum level. Bone soul melding has reached level 10, max. Spirit Binding has reached level 10, max. Advanced Death Magic has reached level 17, which had to be a result of his work with Dove. Or, more accurately, his work on Dove. It was true, his understanding of how to bind spirits to objects had advanced spectacularly, as had his knowledge of fusing those objects to a bound spirit. A welcome reward for the work he'd done, besides making Dove happy, of course. The more abilities that reached the max level before his awakening, the better a position he would be in. There was nothing else major in terms of improvements, so he turned his attention to selecting another necromancer ability. Anoint undead bequeath a portion of your power to a set of remains before it is raised, empowering the ritual. Purify bones purge the bones of impurities as preparation for the raised dead ritual. Yet again, the undead weaver class knew exactly what Tyron wanted, and gave him two options he didn't want to pass up but only let him choose one of them. Choosing either one of these would add an extra step to the preparation of his minions, and likely tip his corpse preparation skill up to 20 immediately. The descriptions lacked detail, as always, so Tyron did his best to intuit what the words meant. What did it mean to bequeath his power? Was it a simple infusion of magic, or something more dramatic and permanent? How did it empower the ritual? What effect did it have? So many questions about this one ability. Purify bones, on the other hand, he understood much better. Within this realm, magic infused everything to some degree, slowly corrupting everything it touched. How long until Rifkin native to this realm were born? Nobody knew the answer, nobody wanted to think about it. 
This skill would enable him to remove that influence from the remains he was working with, purge every trace of foreign magic from them. What effect would that have? Likely, it would enable the bones to more readily create and receive death-aligned energy, hastening the process. He brought his hand to his chin and considered. It would be a worthwhile addition to his current abilities, and it suited his needs, fulfilling his primary goal of creating better and stronger undead But Now that he knew such a thing was possible, he could attempt to recreate the method on his own, saving a skill selection. There were sigils used to drain magic power. They weren't too dissimilar from those used to absorb energy from the atmosphere. He didn't know them, but if he asked Master Willem, the fact that the possibility existed was enough for Tyron. He placed his mark next to anoint undead. Whatever this skill did, he had no idea how he could replicate it. Ending the ritual, he sat still as the power of the unseen flowed through him. After five minutes, he felt ready and pushed himself up from his seat, destroying the ritual paper with a thoughtful expression on his face. It's close, he muttered to himself. Very close. Chapter 137. Is it just me, or does Master Willem look happy today? Happy? Victor scoffed. I'm not sure if the old man even knows how to smile. He leaned closer to his fellow apprentice, Arten. In fact, I heard a rumor that he pushed all the knowledge of joy, happiness and love from his mind purged it from his brain, in order to become a better arcanist. Arten shoved him off. Don't you have work to do Vic? Me. I completed all of my assigned tasks last night. Last night. Did spending so much time with the night owl rub off on you after all? Please don't compare me to that guy Victor rolled his eyes. All he knows how to do is work. Last time I saw him at his shop, he looked like death itself. He eats breaths and drinks magic. Which is what you should do too. A thin, squirrely voice pierced through them, and the two apprentices snapped around to see their master glaring at them from behind. Talented, but lazy, just like so many who have come through my doors master Willem poked Victor in the side with his walking stick. You must admit, I've been putting in more effort lately, Master Victor spluttered as he tried to fend off the nimble stick. My studies have been advancing steadily as well. It's about time the Master grunted, before he turned his glare on Arten. And you, me, the young Arcanus squawked, gesturing to his workbench and pliants. I've been working this whole time. You call this work? Willem snapped. Your sigils are sloppy, poorly aligned, this room isn't even in the right place. Are you trying to ruin the reputation of my shop? Ah, uh, Arten stared down at the core through his glass. Well damn. But this isn't for sale. Master Willem, this is my own project. If your projects are garbage, then what does that say about my workshop? Willem retorted, you're a long way from completing your apprenticeship with rubbish like that. The old master continued down the line, poking and scolding his apprentices as he went. Arten stared at his work even harder before he slumped back with a groan. How can he even see that? I've been scraping away at this damned thing all morning, and I thought it was fine. Victor rested a hand on his shoulder and shook his head in pity. That old man is one of the greatest arcanists the province has ever produced. There's almost no chance he doesn't have an enchanting related mystery. Possibly too. I think poorly formed runes stand out to him like a bad smell. That's why he always enjoyed Lucas' work. That guy was always so precise in his work, it probably smelled like a bouquet of roses. Suddenly he snapped his fingers. Of course. I recognize that pep in his step now. Lucas must be coming. The Night L. Artis wonders. Why would he be coming? He already completed his apprenticeship. Probably wants to nose through the master's books and get some advice. If you couldn't find Arcanus knowledge in Master Willem's library, then it probably didn't exist in the western province. Oh, speak of the kin, and they shall appear Victor observed as a shadow darkened the door to the workshop. The door opened, and the dark-eyed, blonde-haired face of Lucas Umsfield appeared. Once again, he looked as if he hadn't slept in days. Lucas Victor greeted him cheerfully. You look like shit. Vic his friend replied, you look stupid. How are things working out between you and Lady Shan? Well enough Victor demurred. She is charmed by me, as all people are. It's difficult being this handsome and successful. But I bear the burden as best I can. Aha, uh -huh, Lucas said, not really paying attention. Is Master Willem about? I sent a message letting him know I'd be in today. 
I think he went upstairs a few moments ago. He was down here scolding us not long before you arrived. Scolding you. Lucas frowned, then leaned forward and inspected the core under the glass. After a moment, he winced and shook his head. You can do a lot better than this, Artis. I've already heard it from the master. I don't need to hear it from you too. The apprentice groused, flinging his arms into the air. He's a bit sensitive about it, Victor whispered, loudly, to his friend. Sorry if I hit a nerve, Lucas replied, sounding not the least bit sorry. He continued to peer into the glass. It's just a you drunk. Have you been conquest lately? These lines are... Fine. Fine. Artis grumbled as he snatched the core and shoved it into a drawer containing several other failures. I'll start again. Before Victor could say something encouraging, Lucas nodded and said, Good idea. That one was terrible. Nice to see you both. Victor, Artis. He waved to the two of them, and then found his way upstairs. It was uncomfortable for Tyron being back in the workshop. Many of the apprentices still toiling away at their benches, doing bit work and simple commissions for the Willem commercial empire, had been there when he graduated. Over a third of them had been there before he'd even started. Still they ground away, using what free time they had to scrape away at their personal projects, hoping to improve their skills, and finally reach the standards the master set for them. There were more than a few envious stares drilling into his back. As he moved to the far side of the room, and ascended the stairs, he found Master Willem working with the newest apprentices in the cramped upstairs workroom. It felt like decades ago the master had first seen him here, mistaken for a thief, working through the night. Tyron waited respectfully until the instruction was finished before he bowed low, as his teacher turned to face him. Lucas, my lad Willem greeted him warmly. It's always a pleasure. Things are going well at your shop, I hope. They could hardly go badly with your endorsement, Tyron replied dryly. For which I am truly grateful. The thin old man waved his gratitude away. Pish. That's nothing. A plaque on a wall doesn't cost me anything. It isn't often I get an apprentice who truly appreciates the craft. A little thing like that to help you get established is the least I can do. The two young apprentices working upstairs were staring at their master as if he'd gone insane, and Lucas held back a chuckle. The number of apprentices Willem had given his blessing, at this point was two, and one of them didn't even own a shop. Armsfield Enchantments was the only purveyor of enchanted goods in the entire city, other than Master Willem's own, that carried his guarantee for quality. That assurance was a heavy burden. One that Tyron's own apprentice, Flynn, struggled to work under. Nevertheless, it had been a huge risk for Willem to give him that, putting his own reputation on the line, and Tyron would never forget it. Things seemed fine in the workshop he observed as a way of making small talk. Not much has changed, if I'm being honest. The old man wheezed a laugh. Of course they haven't changed. This place hasn't changed in two decades, and that's the way I like it. I'm far too old to be changing the way I work, so I won't. Whoever takes over after me can upset the apple cart if they choose, but I won't. The old master glanced slyly at Tyron from the corner of his eye, gauging his reaction, but the young man only smiled. Speaking of your successor, I did a little work with Master Halfshard recently on a set of runic armor. She's incredible. The only other person I've seen work with such dense, smoothly flowing script is you. At the mention of her name, a complex expression flickered over the old man's face. She's an odd one, that's for sure he muttered. Tyron sensed the old mood of his teacher and felt a little confused. Wouldn't he be proud of having such an accomplished and highly skilled student? A full arcanist like her, she's far ahead of me in terms of skills he freely admitted. I learned a lot just from working alongside her. You fixed her conduits, didn't you? Master Willem surmised. They were almost as good as mine, and I'm pretty much a specialist. She's extremely impressive. Well, that's enough talk on Master Halfshard. For what reason have you come to visit your old master? I was hoping to have the opportunity to examine your library and pick your brain a little, Master Willem. Oh, what are you working on? Tyron hesitated a little. It was dangerous to reveal too much, but he'd already committed by coming this far. I'm interested in creating null magic zones, leeching the ambient energy from an object in order to better enchant it. The arcanist raised his brows. That's fairly advanced work. I'm surprised you would be bothered to take that step. I'm not sliding the products you sell in any way. 
but the difference it would make for such things would be almost undetectable. Tyron gave a slight smile. I've had a few commissions lately, and as a result, I've decided I need to work with more purified materials. I believe you do so with some of your high-end items as well, so I thought I'd look into it and see how applicable it is. Willem held his chin and nodded thoughtfully, his gaze directed upwards as he thought. This kind of thing has an effect when you want to imbue a specific affinity of magic into an object directly which does increase the efficacy of enchantments which deal in the same type of energy. I remember I made a sword for the churns. I used an obsidian shard for the blade, cleansed it of energy, and filled it to the brim with fire magic. When I finished working on it, the sword was so damned hot it could melt steel. He laughed. They had to pay me to make a special hilt and gloves, so anyone could hold the thing. Right, this should be interesting then. Come this way, my boy. With a hop in his step, the old man turned and led them back downstairs, out of the workshop and next door, into the library. The guards on the door, and the librarian who worked inside, were only too happy to wave the owner in, whereas an apprentice would likely get a kick in the shin. It wasn't often the apprentices were given the chance to actually enter the building. Normally they'd make their requests through a slot in the wall, and have the book delivered. Tyron had been in a few times, but never to the restricted sections towards the back which dealt with the master's personal collection. When he noticed Tyron's odd look, his master waved his concerns away. I keep these volumes back here because there's no real application for 99% of students. It's not hard or particularly dangerous to do, but the benefits are so low outside of specific applications that it's a waste of time for students to dedicate themselves to it. The number who will get the chance to do that sort of work is Low. I presume that's because you have the market cornered, Master Willem Tyron chuckled. Everyone in the city knew who the best arcanist was. If you wanted extreme, high-end enchanting done, then you went to Willem. However, the old man worked alone, refusing any help, and at this stage in his career, he only accepted a handful of commissions a year. Only the top, top spenders had a chance to purchase his personal work. For everyone else, they could commission his shop which would mean the work was performed by his senior apprentices, or the few paid arcanists he kept on staff and overseen by the master. Or you could work with Master Halfshard, or any of the few dozen other high-end shops in the city. But if there was one thing everyone in the empire knew about the nobles, it's that they obsessed over having the best. That's true Willem acknowledged, but it won't be for long. As I mentioned the last time we spoke, I'll be retiring soon, and I'd like to have someone I can trust to leave in charge of my store. The old master gave him a significant look. Tyron shrugged uncomfortably. Without an arcanist primary class he began, but Willem threw his hands in the air before he could finish. You could change your primary. It'd be hell. It'd be expensive. You would never be as good as if you'd awoken it. But you would still be the best damn enchanter I've seen in a long long time. You've a gift for the magic, boy. I can't understand why you're so dead set on keeping your curse magic. You aren't using it. You aren't going out to the rifts to fight against the kin. It's such a waste of your talents. The old man was worked up, his pale face turning red, but Tyron's expression firmed. It pains me to disappoint you, Master Willem, and it genuinely did, but for personal reasons that have to do with my family. I refuse to give it up. Would this not the case? I would gladly take you up on your offer, and acknowledge the honor that you show me. I'm terribly sorry, but I cannot do this. He bowed low at the waist towards his teacher, who mastered himself with some difficulty. So you said before, lad he said roughly, before he coughed. Well, well I suppose that's the end of that. I'm grateful for everything you've done for me, Master Willem. Truly, when I had nowhere to go, your workshop was a refuge for me. If ever you need anything from me, you have only to ask. For the time being, I'll be the one doing you the favors he grumped, returning to his usual, somewhat cantankerous mood. Take these two volumes, they'll be more than enough to get you started. If I'm not mistaken, from the base level knowledge there, you'll be able to figure the rest out on your own. I'll have them back to you safely before two weeks have passed. Good. The air was still awkward between them but they parted on good terms after discussing Tyron's work for a while. It truly was a shame. Being offered the keys to the Willem Empire was a dream to every arcanist in the entire province, and Victor would probably punch him in the face if he ever found out that not only had his friend Lucas been offered that fortune, 
but turned it down to boot. Were he anyone else, Tyron would accept and put himself through the torture required to meet the master's expectations. But he wasn't anyone else. He was Tyron Steelum. And he didn't want wealth or status or the acclaim of the nobles. He wanted revenge. He wanted them to burn. And then he wanted to strip their flesh, stuff their souls back into their unliving corpses and bind them to his service for all eternity. Chapter 138 the acknowledgement of the unseen was more than just a number on a page. It was more than just recognition from one's own progress, the advancement of knowledge and execution of a skill. It was both of those things. But it was also a measure of support the unseen, whatever it may be offered to a person. The higher his skills leveled, the more power the all-encompassing entity that swallowed this world would push alongside him. Secure in this knowledge, Tyron couldn't wait to get to work. Twenty fresh corpses awaited his attention. These weren't for experimentation, these would not be ground up and dumped into the sower. For the first time since he'd left the mountain above Cragwhistle, he would raise the dead. However, there was a lot of work to do before he reached that step. Eagerly, he pulled his butcher's tools down from their spot on the wall, giving each blade a quick check to ensure it was sharp and free of nicks. Hacketh had always obsessed over the condition of his knives, and Tyron had found it a good lesson to learn. He didn't particularly enjoy butchering human remains, to put it mildly, and the less time he spent doing it, the happier he was. Well-maintained tools ensure the work progressed smoothly. With his unnatural level of hand coordination and strength, he finished all twenty in a little over two hours, dumping the flesh into the main sewer stream connected to the river. Next, he cleansed the bones in his alchemical solution, wiping away every trace of blood and other organic material, leaving them glistening and clean. He constructed a wide bath for this purpose in an attempt to expedite the process. A steel-plated, layered shelf had been attached to the wall, the top row about level with his head. He could fit five skeletons at a time, using a mechanism to lower the entire rig down into the prepared solution. After ten minutes, he could raise them up and shift the rig along pre-prepared grooves in the wall to the next station into which he lowered the shelves again. In that ten minutes, he'd finished loading another set of five into another steel shelving rig, which were placed into the cleansing solution. It had taken him longer than expected to come up with a working model of the null magic field. Master Willem had probably overestimated him, or understated the difficulty. But after three weeks, he'd learned enough to return the books. Effectively, the enchantments did what he had attempted to do with Dove, but in reverse. Rather than feeding in ambient magic and converting it, he leached out energy that contained affinities, and returned it to neutral. Naturally, that arcane power then had to go somewhere. It would diffuse into the air naturally, but Tyron siphoned it into a power array. May as well put it to use. This is a little more sophisticated than I remember the process Dove observed from the table. From what I recall, all you needed was knives, a flat surface and a cave. I've been tainted by civilization. What can I say? Tyron replied as he carefully laid out the next set of five skeletons on their trays. Getting all this metalwork, and the sliding racks, and the large metal baths installed, had been quite a process. He couldn't do it all himself, obviously. What did he know about carpentry, or metalwork? He hadn't wanted to rely on your for the task either. He'd been getting too comfortable doing that. In the end, it had been Elsbeth and her contacts amongst the followers of the old gods, who delivered a metalworker who could do what he asked, and someone to help him install it all. He'd been reluctant to allow someone else into his study, but someone sworn to silence by God was about as reliable a person as he was likely to find. When the first set of five were done in the leeching array, he lifted them up, shifted them along the track to the right, and brought in the next five, moving each set along. Then he took them and slid the skeletons off the rack one at a time, laying them on a stone slab, still atop the stiff metal sheet they'd been placed on. Good thing bones don't weigh that much he muttered pulling the next from the rack. The metal was heavy, but for a bronze class slayer like him, it was more than manageable. Using this system, he had all the skeletons cleaned, cleansed and sitting on their slabs, with density tests and death magic sensitivity testing complete within an hour. What's next? Dove asked. Still have to test for gaps and leaking power in the bones he said, as he walked around placing small tokens at the feet of each skeleton. And what the fuck are those? Oh, these are just little reminders of what each skeleton is going to be used for. Those three will be archers, too brittle for anything else. 
Those six are pretty dense. They'll be sword and board. The rest will be spears. Can you make bone spears? Dove asked. Not yet. What about swords and shields? Also not yet. You've got a lot to work on. What the fuck have you been doing all this time? Tyron muttered something under his breath but focused on his work. The old method of surrounding the bones in a cloud of his own magic to find weaknesses and leaks in the material was long gone. He'd created a new lens for that purpose. And he employed it now. Whenever he found a gap, he used his bone molding skill to manipulate the bone until the problem had been resolved. Hang on what's that token? It's different from the others. Is that one not going to be a spear skelly? Don't call them spear skellies Tyron frowned. And no, that one's a little special. Actually, thanks for reminding me. He stepped over and shifted that particular skeleton to the most central slab, ensuring it was surrounded by the others. This is the skeleton most conductive to death magic of these 20. It's going to be a locust skeleton. I guess you could say. A locust. It's going to grow wings. No you idiot a locus. It'll be easier to explain after I've started working on it. Alright. But if I see a skeleton bug, I'm leaving. I can't work with anything non-human right now Tyron told him. Eventually, I'll be able to raise other creatures. But not yet. Tyron moved from skeleton to skeleton, completing the process. Then he infused each with a tiny amount of death magic, kick-starting the saturation process. The initial stages of corpse appraisal and preparation were complete. Tyron leaned back, stretched his spine before he laced his fingers and flexed them. Time to put those magic hands to use Dove told him. Yep, yeah, I feel like I'm a little out of practice doing this. By the way, magic hands was my old nickname. Shut up, Dove. Weaving the artificial musculature and ligaments was one of the first things Tyron had ever learned to do as a necromancer. And in his opinion, it remained one of the most fundamental and key skills in his arsenal. This was where a true master of skeleton minions differentiated themselves from the less dedicated. He was determined to make every aspect of his minion creation as flawless as it could be. Stepping to the first skeleton, he began to work from the toes up. All his fears about being out of practice fell away as he continued to work. With the feats and skills he had, along with the bonuses he received from his enchanter subclass, his hands were incredibly dexterous, his fingers danced as he laced together the weave with an effortlessness a younger Tyron would have gaped at. Despite the ease with which he worked, it still took hours to complete all 20 skeletons. Done for today he said to the skull resting on his table. I assume you want to sleep here. Oh. I thought I'd get up and do a fucking dance. I don't want to sleep here, but I will. What other choice do I have? Tyron could only sigh. We're going to work on your body once these 20 are done. I promise. Your promises aren't worth that much to me at this point. But they're all you're going to get, unfortunately. The resentment Dove held towards everything was perfectly understandable. And there was nothing Tyron could say to make it better. Rather than offer platitudes and words, he decided he would simply speak as straight as he could to the former summoner. I'll see you in the morning, Dove. Fine. It was difficult for Tyron to sleep. He was so excited by the prospect of raising minions after so long. Until eventually he forced himself to rest, using the sleep spell to quiet his mind. In the pre-dawn darkness, he awoke and descended to his study immediately. Before anything else, he grabbed his death lens, and carefully examined each skeleton, noting the progress of the death-aligned energy in each. Good morning to you too, Dove noted, grumpy. I didn't want to wake you unnecessarily, Tyron said as he continued to work. Well, I'm actually interested in watching this. You should have made a lot of progress over the last few years. These will be the finest minions I've ever created, Tyron assured him. Satisfied with the progress of each skeleton, Tyron turned to his bench, reaching beneath it to remove a thin, long wooden case. Grasping it carefully in both hands, he placed it next to Dove, whose eyes glowed with curiosity. Got something good in there. Tyron grinned, happy to share the fruits of his labor. This is why I became an enchanter in the first place. Take a look. He flung the case open and poured it in front of the skull. So Dove could see the contents. I see shitty calls. Shitty calls arranged very neatly. Bar Tyron scoffed. What you are looking at is a precisely calculated, intricately worked array. In fact, it's an array of arrays. Each of these will go into one of the 20 skeletons. This is my masterpiece. So what does it do? Essentially, they gather and store power, as well as share it between the 20 linked arrays. 
Thanks to what we learned working on your skull, I've even been able to improve them beyond my original vision, changing the gathered power into death-aligned energy before feeding into the network. Your skeletons are going to be able to passively gather their own magic. Do you want them to cast spells? No, I just want to have to pay less magic to upkeep them and fuel their movement. With this attached, these skeletons will cost nothing to maintain, and will likely not need to draw on my energy even when they're walking around. Only when fighting will I have to pay anything at all. Which means... Which means I'll be able to maintain an army of skeletons ten times the size of what I could before. In fact, with the added death magic flowing through them, the skeletons may even be stronger just from that. Grinning happily, he pulled the first of the core arrays out, and began to set it into the first skeleton. He fused the enchantment to each skeleton in the same place, inside the ribsage on the spine. It was the most protected spot, difficult for an opponent to shatter or target with spells and arrows. Eventually, he might find a way to shape armor for each of his skeleton minions, and this area would be the most important to reinforce. Damaging the array wouldn't harm the skeletons but it was a lot of work for him to remove and replace them. When all 20 was set to his satisfaction, he returned to the bench and removed another, smaller case. Inside was another array, more elaborate than before. And this one is... This one is for my locus. Think of it as a power storage and regulator. It'll manage the amount of energy being distributed through the array, evening it out, and supplying extra where it's needed. So one of the skeletons is going to be like an arcane battery for the others. Exactly. Skeletons share energy between each other naturally. We know that, but this is going to supercharge that process. With the utmost care, he placed the larger array around the first on the central skeleton, before he connected the two. When it was done, he leapt back to the bench, snatching up his lens, and examining each of the skeletons in turn. He grinned. It's already working, he gloated. The energy is flowing. He was so pleased, he clapped his hands together in glee. How many skeletons could he maintain like this? A thousand. And when he advanced his class. How many then? Chapter 139. It kind of looks like you're marinating them. Have you gone full canine? Your hunger for sweet bones can no longer be contained. Didn't I already explain this to you? You did, but I'm bored. I'm working on your fucking hands right now, and you're distracting me. I understand that you want me to feel bad, but I'm still pissed off. I had to sit here for two days before you started. You've been undead for years at this point. Two days shouldn't be a big deal. I told you I'd have time at this point in the process to focus on you, and here we are. It looks weird, that's all I'm saying. Tyron sighed and turned to look at his 20 skeletons. Currently, they were submerged in the bone strengthening solution. Each slab now had raised sides so he could cover each set of remains in the alchemical mixture. It would take a few days for the skeletons to fully saturate with death magic, so he was using this opportunity to test the efficacy of the solution at the same time. This seems like a lot of work for the most basic of the basic minions, Tyre and Dove observed. Not to mention, it looks fucking expensive. Are you really going to do this for each and every one of your skeletons? For revenants, sure. Treat the bones nice and tender, power them up, enchantments, the works. But for these bony boys, no chance this is worth it. In a sense, you aren't wrong Tyron replied as he turned back to focusing on what he was doing. Namely connecting Dove's soul to a pair of skeletal hands. Let's imagine I reach a point similar to the only powerful necromancer I've seen records of, Arin in the Black. An army of undead, tens of thousands of minions. Would it be practical to go through all this trouble for each and every one of them? No, of course not. Zombies and skeletons, the simplest undead minions, are meant to be disposable. Easy to make, easy to lose. So what's the point of all this? Then, you're going in the opposite direction. First of all, I've always been determined to make the best possible minions I can. If my skeletons become twice as strong as they're meant to be, then the effort will be worth it. Even without that consideration, this is all for the sake of experimentation. Right now, I'm doing everything I possibly can to improve the quality of the minions. It may turn out that some things don't have a significant effect, or aren't worth the time and expense, or are impractical in battle. So you're employing the throw everything at the wall approach. For the love of whatever you consider holy, don't reference your dick and walls. Fine. Basically, yes. I still have a couple of steps before I can raise them. But it should only take another day. 
In the meantime, what about me? How's it going? Tyron leaned back with a sigh. Give it a try he gestured toward the hands he'd been working on. They were carved, just like the skull, each bone lovingly recreated. It had taken a huge amount of effort to ensure they articulated properly, were powered, and properly linked to the former summoner. Despite all his careful work on his new minions, these hands might just be his greatest masterpiece so far. Not quite undead, they nevertheless were close, perhaps a cross between golem making and necromancy. As he watched, the fingers twitched, then curled. Slowly, both hands flexed as Dove tested each finger in turn, until he lowered all of them on both hands, except the middle one, which he pointed proudly in Tyron's direction. You're welcome the necromancer said sarcastically. This is amazing Dove breathe. I'd almost forgotten what it was like to have a pair of hands. Look at this. One of the hands fell over, then propped itself up on its fingertips and skittered across the table to one of Tyron's books which he promptly pushed onto the floor. Yes, amazing. Not being able to interact with the world around me has been so maddening. Finally, I can impart my will onto reality. You're starting to sound like a villain. Tyron, I'm an undead mage trapped in a skull who fucking hates everyone. Of course I'm a villain. I'm pretty sure you're a terrorist who wants to burn down the empire, kill their gods and murder the nobles. So I wouldn't exactly consider you a good guy. Are you saying my revenge is unjustified? Tyron clenched his jaw, turning a baleful stare on the skull. Whoa, don't give me the stink eye. I'm just saying it's a matter of perspective. He grit his teeth but forced his anger down as best he could. Someone else would probably say it wouldn't make sense to wreak so much havoc, cause so much upheaval and kill so many people in order to avenge too. No matter how unjust their deaths. Destroy the Magisters. Kill the Nobles. Topple the Divines. Any normal person would probably call him a madman. But he didn't care. Tyron no longer had it in him to spare a thought for what other people might think or feel about what he intended to do. Intellectually, he understood what would happen if he were to succeed. There would be chaos. Complete and utter chaos. If the Magisters were destroyed, their tower knocked down and their control over the Slayers eliminated, society as a whole would collapse in an instant. Most of the Gold Slayers were decent people who just wanted to kill Kin and try to preserve the realm, but there were many who were not. What would happen when the chains were taken off and the immoral, unbeatable warriors were set loose on the public? Were the nobles to die? Then it would mean war, immediate, irrevocable war. The Empire was founded to the east, and they would not sit idly by, and allow a huge chunk of their land to fall to outside influence, nor let their distant relatives' deaths go unpunished. There would be an invasion, a punitive force, followed by a great purge, as everyone and anyone the least bit suspicious was put to death. Blood would run in the streets of Kenmore for years on end. And finally, if he succeeded in his ultimate, unreachable aim, and killed the divines, then their followers, the clergy, and all the support the gods themselves offered to hold back the rifts would be gone overnight. An unthinkable, unmitigated disaster. More kin would roam free. More breaks would occur. How many innocents would die, torn to shreds by the mad beasts from beyond, before the situation became stable again, or the realm was finally lost? Thousands. Tens of thousands. Millions maybe. He knew all of this. He just didn't care. No matter how long he thought on it, or considered the implications, his thoughts didn't waver. Tyron could no longer imagine living in a world in which the people responsible for the deaths of Magnan and Beery continued to live. It was unthinkable against the laws of reality as he viewed them. The light could be cold, the ground liquid up and down could reverse themselves, but his parents would be avenged. Ideas like good and evil never entered his mind. Now that you have hands, we need to work on the rest of the upper body, he said, brushing the earlier conversation aside. We need a spine, collarbone, shoulders, arms and ribs. He shook his arms out. That's going to be a lot of work. It wasn't as simple as just creating musculature and attaching the bones together. He needed to stitch them to Dove's soul. As well, only then could the mage control them. That process was far more difficult and intricate than just creating skeletons. Essentially, Tyron was creating a semi-lick. Rather than binding Dove to his own remains, he was binding him to a golem-like skeletal frame. It would probably have been easier to do it with his own remains. But there would have been added complications as well. Managing the repository. 
The well of power that Dove had access to via the Enchanted Array was another factor that had to be taken into account. If they added too many parts to Dove's soul, and he didn't have the magic required, who knew what kind of damage that could do to him? I do appreciate what you're doing, Kid Dove said almost begrudgingly. It's just... Tyron shook his head. I get it. It's difficult to be grateful to the person who put you in this mess in the first place. Don't worry about it. I'll do my best to get it together quickly. But this process is extremely difficult. I'm figuring it out as I go, and any mistakes are going to blow back onto you. It's not like my existence can get any worse. If you believe that, then your stupid Tyron said flatly. Or maybe you want me to enslave you to my will. Or for your to do it. She could've. Easily. Once upon a time, I'd make a lewd joke at this juncture. Is this personal growth? Should I applaud? Fuck you. No thanks. Very funny. I'm still hoping I can convince you to give me a dick. I might get laid again before you manage a first time. Tyron hesitated for a fraction of a second. Maybe, he said. A moment. You piece of shit. Who is she? The last thing Tyron needed to do was use his new ability, which would empower the ritual somehow. The sensible thing to do would be to vary the amount of arcane energy he fed into each skeleton, so he could measure the result, but he wasn't going to do that. Instead, he was going to pour in everything he could to each minion in order to produce the best result. For that purpose, he had prepared plenty of power cores, and even a stash of mage candy if they proved insufficient. He took a deep breath. Here we go he muttered to himself. You've got this, Kid Dove gave him a double thumbs up. He stepped to the first slab, raised his hands, and began to push his power out through his palms. Words resonated throughout the dark cellar as the arcane energy swirled in a dense cloud, hovering over the ribs. When he poured out everything he could, he cut off the flow and collected himself. Then he raised his hands again, and enacted the raised dead ritual. His words slammed into the air like hammers and his hands, seemed to cut through reality itself, as he used his magic to bend the world to his will. Dull, purple light began to gather in the eyes of the skull. Chapter 140 So how does it feel to have a legion of mindless slaves at your beck, and call once more? Dove asked. Tyron blinked. He was tired. Very tired. Constantly emptying and refilling his magic to use the anoint spell, as well as casting a long and complex piece of ritual magic 20 times was draining, to say the least. But he'd done it. Almost a full day of constant spell work. His mouth was as dry as a bone and his head pounded, but it was all worth it. He greedily gulped down water from the canteen he'd left on his bench, and nibbled at the biscuits he'd brought down for the day. Twenty skeletons stood to attention next to their slabs, totally motionless. The only sign of their unlife the flickering purple light in their eye sockets. Feels good Tyron said finally, almost gleaming with pride as he cast his eyes over the finest skeletons he had ever made. You aren't supposed to admit you feel good having mindless slaves. Tyron snorted. You're the guy who was desperate for me to enslave ghosts and create revengeance. Now I'm supposed to believe you're all squeamish about enslaved artificial minds. Good point. The two skeletal hands on the bench danced about on their fingertips for a moment before they both pointed at the necromancer. But you're back at it finally. Making undead. Necromancing. Now you just need to work out if any of the insane shit you did was actually worth it. For the time and expense, these skeletons better be capable of punching holes in brick walls. Unlikely. Then it was a complete waste of time. Scrap the whole project, start again. Also unlikely. How about you shut up for a minute, and I'll actually take a look at them. Then we can discuss if what I did was worth it. Putting Dove from his mind, Tyron stepped to the closest skeleton, eagerly rubbing his palms together. He could feel the connection between them, the conduit for magic to flow through, as well as the deeper bond that bound the skeleton to his will. Excitingly, the skeleton was drawing nothing from him, just standing there. The ambient magic it collected was enough to power it. The first thing I need to determine is the effectiveness of the reservoir, and the conduit work I've done he said, mostly to himself. And how are you going to do that? Dove replied anyway. Slow and painful repetition. The way of the mage the former summoner said approvingly. Better get some paper ready. I sense measurements in your near future. Using the mage eye, it was possible to see the flow of energy in a general sort of way. 
but for death magic specifically, Tyron turned to his lens. After drawing up some tables and settling himself on a comfortable chair, the experiments to determine the efficacy of his enchanting and conduit work began. Walked to there, he ordered the skeleton with his mind. It did so. He carefully peered through the lens, sensed the link inside him, scribbled something down. Walked back to that spot. Comma he ordered. It did so. He carefully peered through the lens, sensed the link inside him, and scribbled something down. And so on and so on. For five hours. When it was done, Tyron was grinning broadly, staring between the paper in front of him and the minions around the room. This confirms it. Dove he whooped, look at these numbers. And it's so efficient. There's almost no leakage at all. The amount is so tiny I can barely measure it. This is why it's important to strive for as close to lossless as possible. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations, kid. You worked hard for this. So many years of effort all for this. What he'd done was relatively simple. Enchanting wise, especially since a lot of it was based off the repository ritual he'd learned from the Unseen. Even so, what he had done was executed to an absurdly high degree. The flow of energy between the minions was flawless, or as close to it as he could manage. Every skeleton drew in power of their own and fed a portion of it to the Locus, who then stored it and distributed that power to the others based on their need. Marching one skeleton up and down the room had drawn on none of Tyron's magic. None. In fact, the skeleton was almost able to sustain that much activity purely on the energy it absorbed itself. A small trickle had been drawn from the locust to sustain that movement almost undetectable. Two skeletons marching. Same story. There was zero drain on his energy. Three. Same. Four. Same. It was only when ten skeletons were walking at once that he had to pay any magic at all. It's a successful test. But I don't think these bony boys are going to be walking around all naked like that often, right? You still have to give them weapons, shields, armor maybe. The additional weight will increase the magic drain. Also, this is just walking, moving quickly, fighting, digging a fucking hole in the ground. All of that is going to take a ton more energy. Of course, Tyron nodded impatiently, but think about it. Having the minions exist and move without me having to pay any price for it is astounding on its own. Will they draw more power when fully equipped and fighting? Yes, of course. At the same time, I can expand and develop this system to pull in and distribute more magic. There's no reason I need to stop here. Undead who were formed in roughly the same area at roughly the same time already spread death magic between each other. The more undead created at once, the more total death-aligned energy was generated every minute between them. Tyron was effectively piggybacking on that natural system with his enchanted artificial one. He could network more than 20 minions together if he wanted to. Or he could bind the locusts from different groups together, and have them share energy between squads of 20. Ultimately, he would need to find a way to draw in more magic to fuel his minions. But with this alone, he had dramatically cut the cost of maintaining his undead horde. Their movement is so smooth he noted as he commanded a skeleton to show him its full range of motion. Look at the articulation on these fingers. I could get them to hand cast magic, I think. Isn't that fucking obvious? You did these nifty digits, after all Dove wiggled his fingers at him. I really did get a lot better at weaving. The mobility of my fingers has made a huge difference. You didn't think it would. I wasn't sure. The early signs were good and Tyron was immensely pleased with his new minions. When he got weapons in their hands, he was confident they would be able to wield them better and more efficiently than his previous creations, simply from the quality of their musculature. So how are you going to arm them? It'll look a bit suspicious if you go and buy a heap of weapons. Smuggling them into your basement without anyone knowing is going to be another trick. Without saying a word, Tyron walked to the corner and withdrew a femur from an open-topped box. He turned and waved it in the skull's direction. You're going to make all the weapons from bones. Dove exclaimed. By the sweet melons of mercy. How much work do you have to do to get a single fucking skeleton in fighting condition? Tyron shrugged. There are advantages and disadvantages to the necromancer classes. Just like every other. Not summoner. It's flawless. Uh-huh. How many of those astral creatures could you bring out at once? Four. I can maintain hundreds, and I'm not even silver ranked yet. Yeah, but yours are shit. They don't sparkle with ethereal light. True. It was a lot of work, 
But the reality was, Tyron had time on his side. I've got the leisure to slowly amass my strength right now, he said. I get 20 fresh corpses every month, along with a shipment of bones. When I have a decent number of minions, well armed and maybe even armored, then I can advance my class and take my next steps from there. Sounds like you're getting a little complacent, Dove warned him. You think you're so safe that nobody will find you. The powers that be around here have been in charge for a very very long time, for a good reason. They don't fuck around. The second one of the divines notices you, you'll be snuffed out like a candle. You think a god is going to reach down from the clouds and smite me? Tyron laughed. No. They'll tell a noble or a priest and a gold-ranked slayer, will pull your face out of your ass ten minutes later. Don't forget the magisters. They monitor the city like fucking hawks. One whiff of death magic and they'll come down on you like a lightning bolt. I'd like to see them try Tyron snarled. No you fucking don't Dove said. 20 bony boys isn't going to protect you from them. He paused a moment. I'm just trying to warn you that you're still on the clock even if you think you aren't. Every day that passes brings you closer to the inevitable moment of discovery. Fine Tyron breathed out slowly. Maybe I do need to be a little more purposeful with my research. He'd been investigating in so many directions. Perhaps it was time to narrow his focus. Well, for the time being, I need to learn how to make shields, swords and spears out of bones. How in the shit are you going to do that? Well, I can already mold bones into bows. I've been trying to replicate the technique to make other weapons. Trying to grab skills without having to purchase them. I like the way you think. Let's see what you've managed so far. Tyron brought out one of his attempted swords and held it in front of the skull to inspect. Dove studied it carefully. This is terrible. I know. It's supposed to have an edge. I'm no blade master, but I'm sure that swords have an edge. You know for cutting. I can't get the bone to compress properly, Tyron explained, exasperated. You can't make a sword out of just normal bone. The material isn't strong enough, it'd shatter in an instant. It stands to reason you need to compress it somehow. But I haven't been able to figure out the trick. Same for a spear tip, I guess. And for the outer face of a shield. Well, explain to me how you're trying it, and I'll see if I can think of something. Chapter 141 Lord Regis Shan, a pleasure to see you again Tyron bowed. The young master of the Shan family, resplendent in his majesty's robes, nodded slightly, almost succeeding in hiding his contempt. Master Armsfield, thank you for coming on such short notice. We've made an area available for you to work, if you could come this way. Of course. The necromancer straightened, a professional smile on his lips, and burning anger in his heart. One step behind his host, he entered the red tower. Not that the imposing structure itself was red, but rather that was the color associated with the magisters, thanks to their robes. Somewhere in this building dwelled the heart of the brand network. Tyron felt his pulse quicken at the thought. But he was careful to regulate his emotions. Nothing good would come from getting himself too worked up. At this point, he didn't even know why they had summoned him. There will be a final status check here. Regis gestured to a secure room immediately inside the gate. You've already checked me three times. Tyron chuckled, concealing his nerves. Any more status rituals and I'm going to run out of blood. Besides the Baron's castle. This is the most secure building in the entire province, Regis replied dully. Normally, someone like you a person of your status, would not be able to enter at all. The ritual, if you please. I assume this is much the same as the previous check, Tyron asked. As you can see, with a sigh, he stepped into the waiting cage, assisted by the heavily armed and armored guards stationed at this point. The door clanged shut behind him and he waited a second before a small gap slid open, through which he pushed his hand. There was a sharp pain as his palm was cut, followed by the sensation of paper being pressed to the wound. He spoke the ritual and felt queasy as yet more blood was pulled from his body and onto the page. When that was done, an ointment was smeared on his hand which he knew would heal the wound in a few minutes. In fact, it was already itching like mad. He stood silent in the cage for a few minutes longer as they inspected his sheet until finally. The cage door rattled as it was unlocked, and the door hauled open. Thank you for your patience, the guard said, his face hidden behind the faceblade of his helmet. Not a problem, Tyron said. Everything in order, I take it. We unlocked the cage, didn't we? Ah, right, thanks. He stepped out to find Regis waiting for him in the corridor. 
This way he said, and began to walk at a brisk pace down the corridor, forcing Tyron to jog to catch up. Lined with perfectly aligned bricks on either side, the corridor was both long and narrow, causing a suffocating feeling to rise in him the further he walked. Was the entire building like this? One giant claustrophobic warren of paths and security checkpoints. Unlikely, this was probably just what it was like for the outsiders who were brought in. As they traveled in silence, his skin prickled repeatedly as they passed through invisible enchantments, some powerful enough to cause his hair to stand on end. This building really was locked down to an almost ludicrous degree. It would be impossible for them to get any work done. If the Magisters had to pass through all this security every day, which was probably why the senior members lived in the tower itself. Do you live in the tower? He asked innocently as he continued to trail in Regis's wake. I don't the lordling replied, the words clipped. I am still an initiate. When I've finished my trial period, I will become a full Magister and be permitted to live in the tower. As a dutiful third son should, Tyron knew that Magisters weren't allowed to inherit noble estates or titles. So the heirs were never sent to train as one. However, it was expected for the noble families to send spare progeny to help fill the ranks. Nominally, they would swear off their allegiance to their families when they joined. But even the poorest turnip farmer in the province knew that was just lip service. The bickering and infighting of the noble houses played out inside the tower, just as it did in every other aspect of life in the province. I hope you are successful in your ambition, Lord Shan. Don't call me Lord Shan. It's inappropriate. Magister Shan is fine. As you say. Of course, Regis wasn't a lord, and never would be. Perhaps it was rude to remind him of that fact. Though he'd been perfectly happy to play up his noble inheritance at his sister's birthday gathering. I have to say, it's a little intimidating to be here, Tyron admitted openly. This is where the most powerful mages control the fate of the province, after all. A slight smile crossed Regis's face. That's true. The tower is where the divine fight against the rifts is organized. All of our people are kept safe thanks to the work that is done within these walls. Spoken as if you were fighting the rift king yourself, not just holding the leash of those that do. To think that these people actually thought that way. It was just what Tyron had expected. Yet he still found it disgusting. None of this showed on his face, of course. His glamour remained in place, despite the many attempts to unmake it he had endured while entering the building. The old gods were good allies when they wanted to be. In here Regis gestured finally. After almost 10 minutes of fast walking through a twisted network of narrow corridors. Had they gone any longer, Tyron might have no longer been able to track their route. He looked into the small chamber Regis indicated and found it quite sparse, with only a plain wooden table and two chairs inside. With little else to do, he entered and lowered himself into the closest seat. Regis stepped in after him, closing the door behind him, but curiously didn't sit down. Instead, he stood by the closed door, his arms folded in front of him. Tyron tapped his fingers on the table, drumming out a complex rhythm, using his absurd coordination and control. It's quite a thrill to be invited here, truly Tyron said. And I hope I can be of service. But I have to wonder what it is I'm supposed to achieve inside this room. He glanced around. There weren't even tools inside. No glass, no pliance, or anything one would expect to see in a professional arcanist workshop. Regis's face tightened. We just need to wait here for a moment, and then all will become clear. I assure you, he doesn't know either. This was getting more intriguing by the minute. He attempted to engage Regis in further conversation. But the Lordling was reclusive and gave him short, non-answers to most of his questions. Eventually, he relented and waited patiently for someone else to show up. It was difficult to say how long he waited in that small, cramped and windowless chamber. Before finally the door was pulled open to reveal a new arrival. A stout, middle-aged man with a short beard and weathered face entered apologizing as he did so. Very sorry to keep you waiting he said, closing the door behind him. It's so difficult to move around on these lower floors. I get lost half the time I come down here. Tyron rose from his seat to greet the Magister. For that is what he was, judging by his robe. In fact, not an initiate like Regis either but a full magister. Lucas Armsfield he introduced himself, bowing at the waist. I know who you are, of course. We were the ones to invite you, the man said as he sat down, and indicated Tyron should do the same. I am Magister Gildan. I hope young Regis has been able to keep you company. 
He has been an excellent guide and conversationalist. Magister Gildan quite openly looked like he didn't believe a word of it, but was pleased to hear him say it nonetheless. Now, I don't want to waste any more of your time, so we will get straight to what caused us to bring you here, shall I? If it pleases you, it does. The genial expression faded from Gildan's face, replaced with a cold and hard-edged facade. I probably don't need to explain this, but the work we perform here in the tower is inextricably linked to the survival of this province. The Slayers, and by extension, the Magisters, are what protect our people from the ravages of the Rifts. Without us, there would be chaos, and we would fall to the beasts like so much of the realm already has. Oh yeah, you're a real bulwark of civilization. Unaware of the sarcasm running through Tyron's mind, the Magister continued. That means we have to be careful, more than careful, with who we work with, and in what capacity. You've been thoroughly vetted before even reaching this point, and were it not for the unfortunate gaps in your records, then you may well have been sitting here some time ago. Of course, there were gaps in Lucas Elmsfield's records. He didn't exist until Tyron had made him up when he arrived at Woodsedge. Of course, to adopt the persona on a semi-permanent basis, more had been required. Falsified records, bribes and a little illegal contract magic had been required to establish him more firmly within the bureaucracy. However, to make life that much easier, he had put his place of birth as Woodsedge, which no longer existed. Any records kept in the city had been lost in the catastrophe. I trust you've been able to investigate to your satisfaction then, Tyron said. Surprisingly, Gildan shook his head slightly. Not really, he replied shortly. But Master Halfshard and Master Willem have vouched for you, along with young Lord Amos Grayling and our own Magister initiate Regis here. With all of that together, we are at least willing to give you a chance. So saying, he reached into his robe and removed something, placing it on the table, along with appliance, and a small, handheld glass. Why don't you take a look at that, and tell me what you think? Magister Gildan suggested. Tyron frowned. Some sort of test. Despite himself, he was intrigued. What sort of device would the Magisters consider difficult enough to use as a test of ability? The object was cylindrical, formed of several saucer-sized discs stacked on top of each other, with a central rod connecting them all, and holding them roughly two centimeters apart. There were five discs in total, each perfectly flat with completely smooth edges. And layered onto the top and bottom of each disc was dense, dense script, all powered by a high-grade core mounted onto the top of the rod. With none of the normal conveniences of a workshop, it was difficult for him to get a good angle to properly examine the script, but he supposed that was part of the test. He grabbed a glass, small enough to hold in a single hand, and peered through it as he tried to decipher the sigils, and work out their pattern. In only a few seconds, he was frowning. Contained in the bunched runes were a plethora of networks, at least ten on each disc, and he had a strong suspicion that not all of the networks were performing a useful function. They were there to act as decoys, to add complexity and confusion to the pathways to even further muddy the waters. Slowly, his curiosity grew to something more fierce as Tyron's intellect began to heat up. He loved puzzles, he loved sigils, he loved enchanting, and more than anything else, he loved magic. It may have been a parlor trick designed to weed out the incapable, but the device was cunningly designed and beautifully made. The room faded from his perception as he focused even the two magisters vanishing from his awareness. As he turned the object in his hands, his eyes darting from place to place as he peered through the glass. At one point, he even put the glass down and began to feel the script with his fingers, relying on his sense of touch to separate the minuscule runes from each other. He went over it from top to bottom several times before he eventually picked up the pliance and traced several runes muttering to himself as he pieced the networks together, tracking the flow of energy. The variety of sigils used was incredible, and there were many he had never seen before, but with context, he could figure them out. Finally, he placed it back on the table, his awareness returning. His shoulders ached. It's an energy exchanger, he said, then pointed to each of the layers in turn, from water to fire to air to ground, and then back again. He shook his head. I've never seen anything like it. Containing such opposed affinities of magic so close together, the thing should explode if you ever used it. But I bet it doesn't. Whoever made that is a genius. Would you like us to pass on your regards to the creator? Gildan said. I can speak to Master Willem myself. 
Chapter 142 Did I pass? Tyron asked glancing between Regis and Gildan. He thought he'd been quick, but honestly couldn't say how much time had passed. Getting absorbed in a complex piece of magic to an unhealthy degree was one of his flaws, and one he didn't know how he could work on. Magister Gildan chuckled. Well, if we had any doubts as to your talent, those have been assuaged. You certainly figured that out a lot quicker than I did. Oh, are you an Arcanist then? Tyron inquired politely. I am, though I didn't train under your esteemed master. I have to ask, why did you put down the glass and begin to use your fingers? How much could he say? Recently I had the fortune to work on a rare enchanted item. I had to decipher the script inside the object without breaking it. And getting a good line of sight was difficult. So I used my fingers to examine the script. I've continued to use the practice, since it seems like a useful skill to have. I'm impressed you can discern the difference between the lines. I must have sensitive fingers. I really can't explain it any better than that. Fascinating. Well, at this stage you have earned the right to learn a little more about what we may wish for you to do. Though I must stress at this point, Master Armsfield, that your tests are not yet over. Your aptitude for the art of enchanting is high, but we will need to thoroughly examine your abilities before we are prepared to commission you for work. Of course, Tyron nodded. There can be no room for error in the work of the Magisters. I totally understand. Good. For the most part, we train our own Arcanists to manage the many enchantments used within the tower. The defensive arrays, such as the ones you pass through, the reinforcements, the power arrays, so on and so forth. I am one such Arcanist as well. Naturally, this allows us to hold as many secrets as possible close to our chests. But occasionally we need outside expertise to work on more ambitious projects. It is at such times we will reach out to non-affiliated specialists, such as yourself. Magister Grindel extended a hand along with the compliment and Tyron permitted himself a small smile. Over the years, we have called on Master Willem and Master Halfshard, along with a handful of others at the peak of the craft to complete work for us. Should you prove capable enough, we would like to add you to that list of trusted craftspeople. I'm honored you would consider me Tyron bowed in his seat. When he straightened, he bore a pensive expression on his face. If I may ask, do you have a project in mind for me? Or are you simply enrolling me? I don't mind either way. I simply want to stress my limitations and proficiencies. As someone who doesn't have Arcanist as a primary class, my growth potential in the field is limited, and my build is relatively narrow in focus. We are aware of your choices and abilities. Master Willem was able to answer our questions on that front. In terms of a project we have in mind, it's too soon to be talking about something like that. Perhaps there is, perhaps there isn't. For now, we will progress you to the next stage. Will I complete the full process today? He asked. Oh no, Magister Gildan replied as he pushed back his chair and stood with a sigh. We have one more stop today. And then you'll be able to go back to your shop for the time being. For the first time in a while, Regis Shen spoke up. Do you want me to accompany you, Magister Gildan? The older man hesitated a moment, then shook his head. Best not. Head back to your rooms and continue your studies for now. Thank you for your help today, Initiate. Regis bowed low at the waist, turned and walked through the door without so much as a glance in Tyron's direction. Well fuck you too. If his senior noticed this cold treatment, he didn't react. Instead he stepped into the corridor and gestured for Tyron to follow him, which he did. These passages are deliberately obtuse. Without a guide, it's very easy to get lost. We need to head up a few floors, so follow close behind me. Up a few floors, Tyron asked. Into the tower proper. Gildan began to walk at a brisk pace, and the necromancer hurried behind him as his guide talked over his shoulder. These floors are still part of the tower. Work gets done here even if it's a bit inconvenient. As a matter of fact, the tower extends down beneath the surface level quite a ways, so there's a lot that goes on outside the upper floors. We'll head up to the fifth floor, that's about as low as they'll go. They, the person you'll be speaking with. Should I be nervous? Tyron laughed. Gildan turned just enough to eye him over his shoulder as he continued to walk. I am, he said simply. Tyron didn't speak anymore as they made their way through the maze and up the stairs. Eventually they came to a simple, if sturdy, wooden door. Once they reached the fourth floor, the layout of the tower changed to something more conventional and comfortable. But here on the fifth floor, things were more spacious and commodious. 
Tapestries hung from every wall, rich, woven carpets ran down every passage, and spherical light globes were fitted to ornate iron sconces mounted on the walls. Magister Gildan looked as if he were trying to control his nerves, something that didn't do Tyron's attempts to maintain his cool any favors. Who were they going to meet? Some upper crust magister in charge of enchanting in the tower. How was that intimidating? Obviously it was someone important. So he schooled his expression and steadied his breathing. Gildan knocked. Enter came a female voice. After a brief pause, the magister pushed open the door to reveal a comfortable sitting area that led to an ornate desk, behind which a woman sat, with perfect posture, reading a document placed in front of her. Take a seat, she said without looking up. I will be with you in a moment. Following his guide, Tyron entered and tried not to stare at the opulent display of wealth inside the room. Everything glittered with the sheen of magic, even the clock. Almost everything in the room was enchanted to one degree or another. He looked down. Even the rug was enchanted. He pressed his shoes firmly into it and felt a hint of warmth. It generated heat to keep their feet warm. Put on some damn socks. He sat and neatly arranged his robes before he allowed himself to lean back slightly. His gaze focused on the person he was here to meet. It was difficult to say how old she was, not young, certainly, and he noted she did not wear a magister's robe, which he found curious. There was a certain elegance, a dignity in the way she moved, even slight motions like turning a page, were executed as smoothly as a dance. She had brown hair that fell in gentle curls to her shoulders, and wore a simple style dress, decorated with far too many gems. He couldn't help but wonder who this could be. But then she placed her paper down neatly, folded her hands on the table in front of her, and looked at him. In an instant, he felt pierced by her icy blue gaze as a terrible weight fell upon him. A noble. Not just any noble. Not like Regis, or Ammon, or Lady Shan, lordlings and ladies without title or authority. They didn't have the wealth, or the power or the class. After a single second of being the subject of her stare, he knew that this person, whoever she was, did. She possessed the divine right to rule. Desperate to break eye contact, he bowed low in his seat and kept his head down to conceal the sweat breaking out on his forehead. It is an honor to be in your presence, he managed to say smoothly. Your humble servant is known as Master Lucas Umsfield. After a long pause, she spoke. You may rise. To be perfectly truthful, he didn't really want to, but he did, and met her gaze once more. She tilted her head slightly to the side, the merest hint of a frown on her face. I am Lady Erin, she said. I am responsible for ensuring the smooth operation of the tower, and act as a liaison between the court and the magisters. He bowed once more. A pleasure, Lady Erin. When he straightened, he found she was still frowning at him, and he began to feel even more nervous. Break, she said. Wham. Sharp pain exploded. Tyron's head reeled back as his hand flew to his nose. Was it broken? No, there was no blood. In fact, there was no injury at all. What had happened? He felt as if she had punched him in the face. Actually, that wasn't quite it. She had punched him over his face. She'd attacked the glamour. There were mirrors all around the room. But if he so much as glanced at one to check it remained in place. That was as much as confirming he wore one. He straightened and turned his eyes directly on the noble. I'm sorry if I've offended you, he said, unsuccessfully trying to keep all the heat from his tone. But I do not believe I have done anything to warrant such an act. She still stared at him, her eyes endlessly cold. I apologize, she said finally, though she clearly didn't mean it. We must be careful in our work to ensure those we engage with are beyond reproach. It was all he could do not to slump in his chair. Whatever the crone had done to reinforce his glamour, it had held. He needed to buy Elsbeth a cake or something. I will do my best to meet your expectations, he managed to say. Your word is freely given and welcome, but does not suffice for our security. Additional steps need to be taken. Well, then what do you require of me? That you listen. She turned and nodded slightly to Magister Gildan, and he turned his face away. Then her stare returned to Tyron, and he felt locked in place. By my authority, you will not speak of what you have learned here. You will not share what has been discussed, what you have seen or heard through any means. Should you fail to heed this command, your heart will cease to beat, and you will die. Divines make it so. Tyron felt the weight of her authority come crashing down on him like a mountain. It bypassed his resistance, slipped beyond his defenses, 
and wrapped around his mind without him being able to do a single thing about it. Divine right, the highest power of the nobles afforded to them by their classes that were handed down by the five themselves. He had never felt it before, but he knew what it was. Magnan and Beery had known all about it. There were reasons why they avoided the capital like the plague. After a minute in which he felt he was suffocating and suffering a migraine, Tyron slowly began to recover. He was still seated on the chair, a hand clutching at his heart as he sweated profusely. You may go now, Lady Erin said, once again reading through her papers. Magister Gildan stood immediately, and Tyron staggered to his feet. By your will, he managed to say, before he turned and followed his guide. The trip back to the shop was lost in a haze to Tyron, but he made it back somehow. He collapsed into his bed the moment he could, his head still pounding, and his heart still thudding in his chest. The divine right. He hadn't expected it to be so terrifying. But even more than his fear, there was anger, like a roaring bonfire burning in his chest. He was certain, absolutely certain. He had sat in the presence of the person who had overseen his parents' murder. Lady Erin. What an undead she would be. Chapter 143. There's obviously a skill you're missing Dove groaned for the eleventh time that day. If it were possible to do what you're trying to do without it, then you would have figured it out already. Tyron ground his teeth as he tossed aside another shin bone. Shins made the most sense for swords, since they, along with the bones of the forearm, namely the armor, were the hardest in the body, and about the right size. I know he finally retorted as he reached across to grab another from the box to his right. I also know what the skill is. Bone compression, I passed it up at level 36. I can't believe this. You mean all this time you knew what you were missing? Yes. I knew. If I already know how to shape bones thanks to the bow making skill, then what's the point of buying 9000 other ways to manipulate bones? It stands to reason that I should be able to figure out how it should work, given what I already know. That's not how it works, fuckface. Dove wandered over and poked him with a skeletal finger. Just because you've picked up some stuff without having to pay for it doesn't mean everything is just going to drop into your lap. You're trying to gain a skill you don't have and another skill you don't have at the same damn time. You don't know how to compress bones magically. And you don't know how to form a sword from one even if you did. He put his hands on his bony hips and shook his head. No wonder you haven't been getting anywhere. This has been a waste of time. Tyron scowled and shoved the skeletal construct away with one hand. Dove shrieked and covered himself. Who said you could touch my pelvis? I made your pelvis. That doesn't give you the right to ravish me without permission. Balls of the gods, Dove, if you don't shut up, then I'm going to wire your jaw shut. I'm bored. It's great to have a body again, but I can't leave your fucking basement, so the level of enjoyment I get out of it is pretty fucking limited. I'm not all that sympathetic Tyron muttered as he focused on the shin once again. How was he supposed to compress the damn thing? He was getting better at shaping bone the way he wanted to, and quite a few of his efforts looked like functional swords, but they just plain weren't. It was like dough, exceptionally hard dough, but still dough. He could shape it, mold it, stretch and flatten, or squash the whole stupid thing into a ball if he wanted, but he couldn't change its density. He couldn't make it into a ball, and then squish it into a smaller one. Actually, the ball analogy worked fairly well, so he began to adjust the shin, stretching it in some places, pressing it in others, as he attempted to create a round shape out of it. The exercise was more difficult than he'd thought, and required a significant amount of concentration, effort, and magic expenditure on his part. Oh, you don't care about my suffering. Why am I not surprised? Tyron continued to work as he argued with his former mentor. Oh no, you can't walk around the city and have to stay here practicing magic. How terrible. Dove stared at him, the purple flame burning in his empty sockets, then threw up his hands. Of course you. Think it's perfectly fine. Living as a hermit in a cave practicing magic is your idea of paradise. Some of us want more from life. In fact, almost all of us want more from life. You're the weird one. Dove. I went through an enormous amount of effort and personal expense to create that body for you. I wove it to the best of my ability, enchanted it, bound the entire thing to your soul. It was a long and painful process. And I went through all of that in an attempt to bring you some measure of happiness in your life. 
He glared up at the skeleton. So forgive me if I'm not all that patient while you prattle around my study whining about how you can't drink, eat or fuck. I don't care. I don't care. You can help me with what I'm doing. Or study and practice your own magic. But if you keep whinging like a whip dog, I swear I will crush that fucking skull. And leave you to your forever. Finished saying his piece, the necromancer looked down and continued his molding, fuming silently. Dove watched him for a long moment. You're cranky. Something's stressing you out, kid. Other than the ever-present threat of death hanging over your head, I wouldn't stress about it. Death can be a lot less permanent than you think. A grimace flickered over Tyron's face. Yor has already told me my soul is likely to get seized upon by one of a number of vampires. If they manage to sniff it out after I die, I'm tempted to make arrangements for the abyss to take it upon my death just to avoid the possibility. You never told me that. Dove, you've been so wrapped up in yourself you haven't had the time or attention to pay to anything other than Dove. Which I understand, given how shitty everything is for you. But there's been no reason for me to go blabbing to you about my worries. Well, there is now. Whatever is bothering you has gotten you so worked up you're threatening to destroy this incredible specimen of perfection. The former summoner ran his bone hands suggestively over his skeletal frame, which managed to get a smile out of the younger mage. That's the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. Normally, his skeletons moved with a ruthless efficiency even the revenants. Once Dove had gained his full form, he began prancing, dancing and engaging in all sorts of very un-undead-like movements. It was strange to see, to say the least. Just wait until I show you what I'm capable of when I'm fully equipped, Dove boasted, thrusting his bare, bony hips forward repeatedly. I'll kill you. I mean it. Fine. Thankfully, he stopped. What's bothering you? It can't just be that you are still failing to make a sword. Actually, what the heck are you making right now? Tyron held up his completed sphere. I thought I'd mold it into a ball shape, and then try to compress it. Essentially, if I manage to make the ball smaller, then I've succeeded. But you would need to apply force equally from all sides, wouldn't that be harder? Maybe it's harder in practice, but it seems easier conceptually. I don't have to worry about where I should and shouldn't be trying to compress. I just try and compress the whole thing. That makes sense Dove mused, scratching at his bone chin. I'm not distracted, though. Out with it. Spill your problems into the open so I can point and laugh at them. The ball in his hands stubbornly refused to shrink, no matter how he pressed or manipulated it. But he didn't give up. I'm just stressed. There's always too much to do. And with the advancement approaching, I'm worried it won't be optimal. I can't afford to miss out on a class advancement that suits my goals and needs. Your needs are rather specific. Something that supports a large number of powerful undead that you can use to fight and level against the rifts and against the empire. Essentially, you need to be on the path of a Rin and the Black. Exactly Tyron said. I need an army of minions. Nothing else will be sufficient. Having come so far, the thought of failing at this point is just unacceptable. Which is why failing to make a sword is pissing you off so much. Probably. I don't know. Dove. I just don't understand why this thing won't fucking shrink. He was trying to use his hands and magic to press on the ball from all sides at once. But all that happened was the bone cracked, forcing him to repair it. At least he was training his bone mending at the same time. Part of his irritation stemmed from the fact he was certain there was some sort of unified bone modification skill. Which would allow him to perform all of these functions at once. Mending, shaping, compressing, probably merging as well. He just wasn't high enough level to access it. The thought of wasting multiple skill selections, and then losing them to an advanced skill down the line, filled him with dread. Look, kid, you're already fucked. A lone wolf going up against an entire empire full of expert wolf killers. Rebellions like this get cut off at the knees a couple of times every century. The odds of you succeeding are infinitesimal. This is real encouraging so far. I'm just saying you should relax a little and go with the flow. The current course of action is already certain death. Not much room to go down from there. The skeleton construct considered for a moment. Or you could let go of your need for revenge and live a quiet life enchanting. You do have that option. No, I don't. The necromancer stared at the sphere in front of him, as if by his will alone he could condense it. I don't care how powerful they are. Or how many get in my way. They will pay for what they've done. 
He said it simply as if stating a universally accepted truth. Up was up, down was down, Tyron would have his vengeance. Well, in that case, I think you need to pick up the pace. You've got what? 40 of your new bony boys. I'm not sure that's going to cut it against the Empire. He'd worked tirelessly to hone his skills and spells, while perfecting his ability to create undead over the past month. While maintaining the stock in the shop and keeping up appearances, he had devoted every spare waking hour to his craft. The problem wasn't that he hadn't been working hard enough, it was the lack of progress. His current minions may be the strongest he'd ever created, but there weren't enough of them and he was only gaining 20 a month. He still needed more. He needed ghosts and powerful revenants to anchor his force. Weapons for the skeletons had to be secured, and then he needed to start fighting. None of it could happen until he advanced. He was on the precipice. He just needed to find the courage to fling himself off the edge. Like forging a blade, he was trying to create the perfect version of himself. Right now, he was in the fire unsure of when he could pull himself out. There was no way to be sure, so he may as well just go for it. I've decided, he said firmly. Tomorrow, I'll perform the status ritual. Delaying any further is only going to drive me insane. Good man. Dove clapped him on the back. Good to see a bit of fuck you. Energy back in your eyes. Metal changed in the fire. It grew softer, more malleable. Only when you took it out could you make something useful with it. Shape it. The sphere of bone weighed heavily in his hand. He tilted his head as he gazed at it. Bone, as it was, could be shaped. He could do that much, but he couldn't hammer it. There needed to be a qualitative change before something like that with metal. Cold metal couldn't be compressed. It had to be heated first. So what did he have to do to the bone before he could compress it? Heat it. That didn't make sense. It would just crack. Dove was talking. But Tyron was no longer listening. What could he do that he knew could create qualitative change within bones? Death magic was the answer. It was the only form of energy that remains could accept. He'd taken the death infusion skill a while back, but hadn't yet found much use for it outside of a few experiments. He could pour death magic into an object via touch, transmuting the neutral energy from his body into the more dangerous form. It allowed him to kickstart the saturation process of remains whenever he wanted. He hadn't tested it yet, but he could use it as a weapon in a pinch, a literal touch of death. Wanting to understand more about death magic, he picked it since it allowed him to produce the stuff on demand. But since he hadn't found a way to utilize it when creating minions, he hadn't devoted the time to the skill he should have. There were trace amounts of death magic in the sphere of bone presently, but that could rapidly change. With a frown of concentration, he began to infuse it with arcane power. Death-aligned energy flowed from his hand and into the ball, as he watched it carefully. The light around his hand began to darken as he poured out more. More. The sphere was saturated now, but he didn't stop. More power. More death. The ball itself began to darken as he continued, the bone going from a bleached white to an ominous, smoking black. Now, suffused with so much power, the bone didn't behave as it had before. He could sense the difference. Taking the sphere in his hands, he gripped it physically and also with his will. He pressed. You prick. I can't believe you figured that out. Chapter 144. He'd done everything he could think of, but Tyron was still unbelievably anxious. What if it went wrong? What if his advancement options were terrible? For the millionth time, he cursed his lack of a proper class guide. Without any clue of what was even possible for a necromancer to grow into, he was totally fumbling in the dark. His nerve wavered, but he firmed it again as he stared down at the blank piece of paper. You did everything you could. Raising more minions isn't going to help. You've learned everything that you can at this point. It wasn't completely true. And he knew it. He could spend years chasing down every idea he had. Seeing which ones bore fruit and which didn't. Modifying. Tinkering. Squeezing every last drop from his spells and skills. It was easy to become 90% proficient at a spell. But the last fraction took twice as much time and energy as the previous 90. More and more, he'd begun to feel time was against him. As more minions accumulated in the sewers around his shop, more and more death magic was creeping into the air. He did his best to suppress it, going so far as to install enchantments that both concealed his minions, and converted any ambient death energy to unaligned neutral power. 
But all it took was one slip, and he would be exposed. He needed to get his minions out of the city and get to fighting with them. That meant completing his advancement. He'd already delayed it once. When talking to Dove, he'd said he'd do it the next day. In reality, that had been three weeks ago. Discovering how to compress bone had been a major breakthrough. And he'd experimented extensively, even managed to create decent swords and shields. Though he wasn't prepared to arm his minions with them yet. Then he delayed a little longer, so he could process the next batch of 20 bodies and raise them, just in case. So now he had 60 skeletons stashed in the sewers, increasing his risk even further. Stop stalling, Tyron he muttered to himself. Just do it. With a shaking hand, he withdrew the dagger from his belt and pressed his thumb into the tip. The cut was much deeper than required, and he winced as the blood flowed freely. Still, he pressed the digit to the page and enacted the ritual. Immediately, the blood began to creep across the paper, forming letters, words and sentences, until it came to a stop, the ritual complete. Not daring yet to read, he snatched up a clean bandage and pressed it to his thumb, wrapping it tight to prevent further blood loss. Then, with no excuses left, he sighed and looked down at the page, trembling with nerves. There were several lines about improvements to his enchanting, but he glossed over them quickly to focus on what he cared about. Your understanding of the methods needed to assess remains has advanced. Corpse appraisal has reached level 20. Your understanding of the methods needed to prepare remains has advanced. Corpse preparation has reached level 20. You have discerned a method to forge bone like steel and mold it to your needs. Bone forging has been learned. Bone weapon sculpting, bow and bone mending have been subsumed. Your understanding of death magic has deepened. Advanced death magic has reached level 20. Your capacity to modify existing minions has improved. Minion modification has reached level 7. Your ability to insert death-aligned energy through touch has improved. Death infusion has reached level 4. Your skill at weaving magical sinew has increased. Bone animus has reached level 20. Your understanding of the ritual has grown stronger. Raise dead has reached level 30. Your comprehension of the spell has grown stronger. Anoint undead has reached level 3. You have raised minions and improved your craft. Undead Weaver has reached level 40. You have received plus 2 strength, plus 4 constitution, plus 6 intelligence, plus 2 wisdom, plus 2 willpower, plus 2 manipulation and plus 4 poise. The world slowly tumbles toward chaos, and your patrons delight. The Abyss hungers. Forbidden One has reached level 25. You have received plus 2 constitution, plus 2 intelligence, plus 2 willpower plus one manipulation, and plus one poise. Name, Tyron Steelum. Age, 23. Race, Human, level 20. Class, Undead Weaver, level 40. Subclasses, Forbidden One, level 25. Focused Enchanter, level 40. None, Racial Feats, level 5. Steady Hand, level 10. Night Owl, Feat Selections Available, 2. Attributes, Strength, 42. Dexterity, 99, Constitution, 132, Intelligence, 251, Wisdom, 163, Willpower, 113, Charisma, 43, Manipulation, 64, Poise, 68, General Skills, Arithmetic, Level 5 Right Parenthesis Max, Handwriting, Level 5 Right Parenthesis Max, Concentration, level 5 right parenthesis max. Cooking, level 4. Sling, level 3. Swordsmanship, level 2. Sneak, level 3. Butchery, level 5 right parenthesis max. Engraving, level 5 right parenthesis max. Skill selections available. 5. Necromancer skills. Corpse appraisal, level 20 right parenthesis max. Corpse preparation, level 20 right parenthesis max. Advanced Death Magic, level 20 right parenthesis max. Enhanced Minion Commander, level 6. Undead Control, level 4. Minion Modification, level 7. Bone Soul Melding, level 10 right parenthesis max. Death Infusion, level 4. Bone Forging, level 10 right parenthesis max. Anathema Skills, Abyss Tongue, level 4. Spell Concealment, level 10 right parenthesis max. Arcanist Skills. Expert Magic Scripting, level 30 right parenthesis max. Channeling, level 10 right parenthesis max. Pliance Control, level 10 right parenthesis max. 
Expanded Sigil Formation, Level 15. Core Linking, Level 10 Right Parenthesis Max. Advanced Fine Motor Control, Level 15. Expert Network Formation, Level 25. Advanced Conduit Magic, Level 20 Right Parenthesis Max. Advanced Core Sense, Level 15. Expert Power Control, Level 26. General Spells. Globe of Light, Level 5 Right Parenthesis Max. Sleep, Level 5 Right Parenthesis Max. Magic Bolt, Level 5 Right Parenthesis Max. Magic Eye, Level 5 Right Parenthesis Max. Necromancer Spells. Raise Dead, Level 30 Right Parenthesis Max. Bone Animus, Level 20 Right Parenthesis Max. Commune with Spirits, Level 6. Shivering Curse, Level 6. Death Blades, Level 7. Empowered Bone Armor, Level 5. Minion Sight, Level 6. Spirit Binding, Level 10 Right Parenthesis Max. Death's Grasp, Level 5. Anoint Dead, Level 3. Anathema Spells. Pierce the Veil, Level 5. Appeal to the Court, Level 4. Dark Communion, Level 1. Advanced Suppress Mind, Level 17. Repository, Level 6. Fear, Level 3. Glamour, Level 10 Right Parenthesis Max. Invasive Persuasion, Level 10 Right Parenthesis Max. Crone's Shade, Level 5. Bewitch, Level 10 Right Parenthesis Max. Necromancer Feats. Skeleton Focus 2. Magic Battery 2. Bone Mastery. Spirit Mastery. Undead Specialist. Anathema Feats. Repository. Wall of Thought 2. Drain Life. Arcanus Feats. Magic Thread Control 2. Compact Sigils 2. Conduit Seal 2. Core Networking 2. Mysteries. Spell Shaping Advanced. Int plus 20. Wiss plus 20. Words of Power Advanced. Wiss plus 20. Char plus 20. Undead Weaver has reached level 40. Choose an additional feat. Zombie Focus I improve the quality of raised zombies. Skeleton Focus 3 improve the quality of raised skeletons. Spirit Focus I improve the quality of raised spirits. Flesh Mastery increase skill with flesh based undead and abilities. Minion Controller improve the capacity to direct undead. Intelligent Dead improve the minds of undead minions. Boon Giver spells and abilities that empower the dead are strengthened. Undead Weaver has reached level 40. Choose one additional skill or spell. Skills. Ghoul Flesh instill death magic into the flesh of the deceased. Bone Compression Harden and Compress Bone. Bone Weapon Sculpting. Sword Create Swords from Bone. Bone Fusion Meld Bones Together. Spells. Crepify an infusion of power to undead flesh, rapidly healing damage and strengthening it for a duration. Undead leader bind undead to one of their own to empower it and increase its intelligence. Command spirit replaces commune with spirits, and raises the maximum level to 20. Death fist replaces death's grasp, and raises the maximum level to 20. Mark for death curse a target. Your minions will hunt it and be stronger when fighting the victim. Purify bones purge the bones of impurities as preparation for the raised dead ritual. Black miasma create a cloud of death saturated energy that empowers and heals undead while hindering the living. Forbidden one has reached level 25. Choose an additional feat. Dark favor curry favor and strengthen your connection to the dark ones. Abyssal favor curry favor and strengthen your connection to the abyss. Scarlet favor curry favor and strengthen your connection to the scarlet court. Ruler in shade your false faces are harder to overcome or pierce. Corrupting presence encourage death magic growth in all around you, even the living. Bewitching gaze those who look into your eyes are more susceptible to magical influence. Black soul tune your spirit to the void. Dead flesh adapt your body to contain death aligned energy. Stormwise empower all of your abilities when the sun is hidden by cloud. Still blood your blood will cease to flow and change. Tyron slumped forward, relief filling him. He'd done it. He'd actually done it. Even more than he'd hoped, he'd been able to max out far more abilities than expected. The odds of him getting the advancement he wanted had vastly increased. A part of him wanted to rush through his ability selections, just so he could pick his advancement that little bit faster. But he held himself back and went through the notifications carefully. Almost immediately, a smile tugged at his lips. He'd been right, there was a unified bone manipulation skill, and he'd gotten it. This was a great achievement, though it wasn't without its shortcomings. He'd be able to make swords now, sure, but he wouldn't have the knowledge and instincts that selecting the bone weapon sculpting sword would have gotten him. 
He'd need to work out how to make the best swords, shields, spears and whatever else he wanted on his own. Even Ray's dead had reached level 30. A warm sense of pride filled him as he gazed down on the notifications. His father and mother had always emphasized mastering the basic elements of a class, and here he was being faithful to their advice. He felt a pang in his chest, but pushed it aside. He needed to choose his final feat from his current class, and the choice was difficult. Anything to do with flesh-based undead was out, obviously, as was Boon Giver, since he didn't focus on powering up his minions after they were created. But that left several things he was interested in. Skeleton Focus 3 was still appealing to him, as skeletons would form the bedrock of any undead army he hoped to build. Intelligent undead and minion controller were also tempting but his lack of information held him back. He'd get better at controlling more minions, but by homage. Similarly, how much smarter would his minions get? How useful would that be? Did he even need either when he could create revenants and have them direct his other undead? After some hesitation, he selected the next rank in skeleton focus. It was disappointing not to reach the fourth and presumably highest level in this feat chain, but this was the widest applicable boost he could get for his minions right now. Then he needed to select a new spell or skill. His last for the Undead Weaver class. The two new options were obviously powerful. Bone Fusion would have been incredibly tempting if not for his breakthrough, as he suspected he knew what it would allow him to do. Creating bone constructs, much as he had with Dove, but with real bones, would be possible with that skill. With Bone Forging, he should be able to achieve the same end result, though with far more trial and error. Black Miasma, the other level 40 selection, was interesting. It allowed him to empower and heal his undead as a fight was going. That was certainly a powerful effect, though it likely would cost an unbelievable amount of magic to create and maintain. Thankfully, his maintenance costs had gone down as much as they had, along with his capacity climbing through the roof. He could choose it. His eye flicked down to the Forbidden One feats. This was his first chance to see them, and many of the options were unappealing. Curry favor with the patrons. He grimaced. If he had two, sure, but at the cost of a feat. Unlikely. Ruler in Shade was tempting, more than tempting. Having his mask broken was one of his greatest fears. Bewitching gaze was something he felt would be useful, but wasn't enamored with selecting. Manipulation was a necessity of his existence, but he didn't enjoy it. For survival, he would gladly shove his preferences aside. These transformational feats. He shuddered. Doubtless, they would be powerful even if he couldn't understand exactly what they did. How he was supposed to keep a low profile if his flesh became imbued with death magic? He had no idea. Stormwise. Surely not. He checked the wording of Black Miasma. It specifically mentioned Cloud. The Unseen was always precise with its language, which meant these two abilities would interact. If he stood within the Miasma while his minions fought, the feat would become active. That sort of synergy seemed too obvious to be accidental. Perhaps his patrons had a finger on the scale in his favor. Still, the combination would be potent. He was sure. He selected both options, then took a deep breath. This was the moment. He confirmed his selections, endured the change, then pressed his thumb to the page once more. Blood flowed, and he leaned forward, breath caught in his throat. Undead Weaver has reached level 40. Select a class advancement from the following. Necromaster. Further your understanding of the necromantic craft. Following on from Necro Acolyte that he'd been offered at level 20, this was likely the default advancement for reaching the silver rank. It didn't hold much interest for Tyron. Soulbinder. Bend the spirits of the dead to your will. Likely this advancement didn't focus on ghosts alone, but perhaps other types of spirit-based undead, perhaps revenants also. There was a whole world of more powerful ghosts out there, including some who could manifest themselves physically. This class would be his first opportunity to learn the secrets of their creation. Lick Initiate. Learn the secrets of eternal life. Tyron paused as he saw this option. A Lick. Would this class really give him the skills? and spells needed to turn himself into a lick and change his race. Interestingly, he didn't need to use those abilities on himself. He could turn others into undead and bind them to his will. Lord of the Oswari. Harness the most powerful skeletal minions. With his complete mastery over every bone-related skill he had, this option didn't surprise him. This would be another path toward creating revenants. Something he could already do, 
but would also have the greatest chance of empowering them. Perhaps it would also facilitate a large number of minions as well. A possibility, to be certain. Bone Smith. Constructs of blood and bone will serve. This was unexpected. Perhaps it had become available due to his unlocking of the bone forging skill. Perhaps it would focus on the creation of weapons and armor, as well as larger constructs. Acolyte of Death. Death energy will heed your call. Another unexpected option focused on death-aligned magic itself. No doubt this had become available thanks to his maxing of advanced death magic. But what would the class focus on? Using death magic to fling spells and empower minions, probably. It sounded powerful, but wasn't what he focused on. No more options appeared, and Tyron leaned back to think. This was where his ability as a necromancer would flourish. From the beginning, he had known that his class was one that grew much stronger at the higher levels relative to other classes. Now that he'd reached level 40, he was finally at the point where he would become a force to be reckoned with even against other slayers. All he needed was a few things to go right. With enough minions to fight, he could gain levels extremely quickly, so long as he could occupy a rift. So what did he want? What would make him the strongest? What was he best at? He didn't want to be a lick, so choosing that option felt wasteful even if he was very curious as to what he may learn. Necromaster was also out. It was generic and likely weaker than the others. Soulbinder would doubtlessly be strong, but ghosts were not his area of expertise at this point. There would be much he would need to learn to maximize their strengths. Could he really afford to wait that long? Acolyte of Death was tempting, but somewhat mysterious. Would it focus on minions, or something else? Death energy would heed his call. But in what way? His lack of knowledge was frustrating. This class would be powerful, he was sure, but would it synergize with him? Bone Smith and Lord of the Ossuary. Those were both fascinating options that worked well with what he could currently do. Already, he had ideas for constructs he could create to support his skeletons in the field. With the guidance of Bone Smith, he could make those ideas a reality. However, there was a chance he could do that anyway. Lord of the Ossuary. The most potent skeletal minions he knew of were Revenants which he could already make, and whites, which he couldn't. Of all the options he had available, this was the only one that hinted that it would help him reach the quality and quantity of minions he needed to threaten an empire. He chose it. This is the end of this video. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you for your supportive comments. Have a wonderful rest of the day. The Silent Rupt is out.